Hello everyone, this is Thersites the Historian. I apologize for the delay tonight. Um, it took me a long time to get all the research done and to also get the tier list up and running. But I think everything is now ready, so I'd rather begin a little late than not be prepared. So tonight we're looking at the Dong Zhuo faction, and at the last minute, which by which I mean about 4 o'clock today, I decided to kind of extend this to also cover the Lu Bu faction since I feel like there's not a clear division between Dong Zhuo's faction and Lu Bu's. So, what we'll do tonight is basically cover Dong Zhuo and Lu Bu, and I'll change the title later, but that's effectively what's going to happen. So, let's move over to our list and also let me know if you can hear me and if everything is good to go before we switch screens because it'll be a little harder for me to switch screens and keep track of everything because I'm going it solo tonight I started a little late so audience numbers are a little lower than normal but yeah let me know if you can hear me and then we'll move over to the list itself if that is good with everybody So holler if you hear me, to quote the great Scott Steiner, the genetic freak. Master of the German suplex. Okay, well, I'll take that effectively as a yes, that you guys can hear me. I know there's a delay, I don't know how long it is though, so I can't really determine that. Okay. Yeah, sound insulation. Yeah, I don't have a very good sound environment. This is the best room I have. My The office that I wanted to record in, even though it's tiny and full of stuff, has a horrible echo. Uh, that, an echo that's powerful enough that if my dog goes in there and barks with the door closed, that's an instant headache. And I'm talking one bark. Instant headache. Because the echo is that bad, so... Anyway, um, yeah, I don't know what I can really do about that. The house has a pretty bad echo as a whole, and this is the best room, so. All right. So, tonight we're looking at, I think, 33 officers of Dong Zhuo and Lu Bu. Well... Normally, I'd want to jump into a little bit of background, but I think the background will reveal itself as we move forward in this case, since we'll have to go through a lot of Dong Zhuo's career and a lot of the details we look at his subordinates, because a lot of what we have on them and a lot of what their careers ended up being was effectively what Dong Zhuo allowed or made possible. But we have to begin with the man himself, Dong Zhuo. He is well known today, I believe, in the West because of all of the Koei games and also Three Kingdoms Total War. In all of these games, he is portrayed as he is in the novel as this fat, evil tyrant. A man who took advantage of the situation to seize control of the Han court, began to relentlessly persecute his enemies, and to try to establish his control over the emperor, even going so far as to depose one emperor and appoint his younger brother, to further consolidate his control. Well, by and large, the general portrait of Dong Zhuo as a fat, tyrannical opportunist is accurate. That's not wrong. But in terms of how he's portrayed in a lot of the Koei games as this arch-schemer, that can be a little bit exaggerated, but there actually is some evidence for it. And in terms of his ruthlessness, it, he definitely could be ruthless, but we'll see many examples tonight of him relenting at the last minute and sparing people. So he was not bloodthirsty, but he was willing to shed blood to achieve his ambitions. So Dong Zhuo is a complicated guy, and I hope that as we explore his life and times, we'll see that more and more. So... Dong Zhuo had a father who was about a mid-level official, give or take, and that accounts for a lot of his 
childhood and a lot of the opportunities that he had. He has a younger brother, who will be the second person we cover, named Dong Min. But they were about 10 years apart and probably not super close. As a young man, Dong Zhuo grew up in the West, and he had a lot of dealings with the Qiang people there. And that accounts for why he was frequently appointed to be the commander in the West during the 180s. Because he had a childhood link to the area. So, Dong Zhuo, um, as a young man, also led a number of troops on the frontier. So his, his early background was mostly military. And as I mentioned, in the Han era, when you entered the bureaucracy, you weren't clearly a member of the military. You were more in the bureaucracy as a whole, and the army was a part of that. So there were people who had specialties, but Dong Zhuo's specialty was as a commander. Early in his career, presumably before he got fat, he was a reasonably capable warrior and a decent-ish commander. He was known as being fairly strong and, uh, you know, a physically imposing individual, which kind of links up with him getting fatter as he got older. A lot of people who are very athletic have slow metabolisms, which enables them to both build muscle, but also means that if they become sedentary, they get fat really fast. So that kind of adds up. Dong Zhuo had a number of deeds as a young man in the 160s and 170s. By 184, he was appointed to the West in order to take on the Yellow Turbans who were stationed in that area. He did not do very well, though. It would appear that while Dong Zhuo in his early career was very successful, and while he did have some political skills... When it came to higher level command, this was not something that he was well suited for. And we'll see that consistently, as a strategic general, he would fail repeatedly. So, in the fall of 184, after a year of failure, he was dismissed. Then later on, the Yellow Turbans are dealt with in the west, but then the, Liang, uh, the, the province of Liang would revolt. He'd be sent out as the lead commander, but not do that well. So he's having trouble against the Liang Revolt, so Huang Fu Song is sent out to replace him. The two of them then feud. We'll get into that more when we talk about Huang Fu Song in a little bit. Suffice to say, Huang Fu Song deals with the problem, and Dong Zhuo is still deeply resentful of the fact that he was replaced by Huang Fu, and also that Huang Fu disregarded his advice. So, Dong Zhuo could be a petty man. He did not take kindly to anyone who won glory that was at his expense. He then, of course, would later petition in the court against Huang Fu's interest, as we discussed in the Yellow Turban video a couple weeks back. So Dong Zhuo in the 180s did not really distinguish himself, yet this wouldn't really uh, hold back his career much. Dong Zhuo was very politically savvy, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and he was able to really make people forget about all of his many military failings. So he could lose a number of major campaigns and still hold prestige. So he's one of those guys who had a political ability to explain away why he was failing so hard. That was really his chief skill, at least, I think, based on reading uh, his record. So Huang Fu uh, Song goes back to the capital. Dong Zhuo effectively defied his commander, because when Dong Zhuo was appointed as a governor, he was supposed to hand over his 20,000 troops to Huang Fu. He refused. Huang Fu Song would have taken action, but the Han court simply reprimanded Dong Zhuo. So he basically just took the reprimand, kept the troops, and got away with it. And then Huang Fu Song let it stand and went home. So Dong Zhuo now had a force of 20,000 troops he was, wasn't supposed to have, in addition to whatever troops he had in the province already. So, as we head into 189, 
and Ho Jin's efforts to repress the eunuchs at court, Dong Zhuo has one of the largest standing armies in China, and he now has a, an official invite from Ho Jin to the court. We have to keep in mind that despite all of his failings, he is still one of the senior commanders in the empire. The fact that he had failed a number of times did not diminish his standing official rank. So, keep that in mind. So, Ho Jin is murdered before Dong Zhuo gets there. Yuan Shao and others then kill the eunuchs, and now there's not really much of a divide. It, there's sort of a power vacuum. Dong Zhuo comes in, he's able to present the letter he got from Ho Jin, which says that he's supposed to come there to help restore order. And as the senior commander there, with a huge number of troops, he basically just asserts himself and says, I'm in charge now. And no one's in a position to resist. Some of the people who are in a position to say no or to resist, such as Huang Fu Song, who's still around and technically senior in theory, don't do anything. So Dong Zhuo says, fuck it, I'm in charge now. No one's going to do anything. So not only that, but also I would like to enhance my authority. So I'm going to take the Emperor Xiao and replace him with his younger brother, Xian. So a new emperor will be coming to the throne. And this was largely just to enhance his own standing. But when he does this, this causes lots of resentment. Around this time, if not before, Dong Zhuo also tried to really justify his rule by inviting a lot of people who had become sort of cultural icons for resisting unit corruption back to court. So he calls in a number of people, many of whom we'll discuss, and these guys are supposed to shore up his regime and make it look like he is some sort of crusader against corruption and someone who will fight the eunuchs and really push for reform. To be fair, we don't have too many other attestations of eunuch influence at court, so perhaps he did deal with that problem. However, he did antagonize a number of people through his personal interactions. Dong Zhuo seems to have been a somewhat reprehensible person on a purely personal level. He seems to have been someone who was hard to get along with, imperious, arrogant. And another thing that he did which really pissed people off is that because he was dealing with the child emperor, he availed himself of the women of the court. Now normally the women of the court were only there for the emperor's pleasure. That is to say they were sort of an unofficial harem. But Dong Zhuo just decided, well, the emperor is not of age yet, and if I wait to get his permission when he understands what's going on, by that point I might be too old. By this point, Dong Zhuo is over 50. So I might be too old by that point to really enjoy this, so fuck it, I'm just going to go and have my way with all these women. While I'm still young enough to enjoy it, and the emperor is too young to care. So he avails himself of all the women at court. This causes a massive outrage because, again, the women there were supposed to be just for the emperor. He also decides to find someone who will be an imposing bodyguard, someone who can be an able second. So he turns to Lu Bu. And he had gotten Lu Bu to defect from a local warlord, Ding Yuan. So Lu Bu had been that man's adoptive son. Lu Bu betrayed him, came over to Dong Zhuo, and then Dong Zhuo takes him on as a bodyguard, and possibly also adopts him as a son. Now, most likely the adoption of a son is a piece of fiction, simply because it is very implausible. Uh, Dong Zhuo did have a family. We'll meet a few of them as we move along. But it does appear that if he did have any children, they were not yet of age. He seems to have waited a little later to get married. And also it's possible that his would-be heirs would have been his younger brother and perhaps his brother's family rather than children he had spawned himself. At any rate, though, he, he didn't need to adopt a son. He had other ways to pass on his position in life. So adopting Lu Bu was most likely just pure fiction. But he did take Lu Bu on as a bodyguard. And unfortunately for Dong, uh, Lu Bu also decided that the women of the court were available for his personal pleasure. So basically the two of them would probably become Eskimo brothers a few times over, just between sharing the women of the court. And that was apparently one of the major sources of friction between them, 
since Dong Zhuo interpreted Lu Bu's horniness as a sign of disloyalty. Dong Zhuo also had a problem with anger. He was prone to throw fits where he would even throw weapons at people at court. And that was considered to be, for obvious reasons, unacceptable. And one of the men he threw weapons at was Lu Bu, his personal bodyguard, which was a huge fuck-up on his part. Because you don't antagonize the people who are entrusted with protecting your life. But Lu, but Dong Zhuo did that. Outside of the court, he did manage to make a number of major enemies, including Cao Cao, famously, and Yuan Shao. It's unclear exactly what the course of events was, but when Yuan Shao became the official leader of the coalition against Dong Zhuo, Dong Zhuo retaliated by having members of the Yuan family killed. And this would have been a major betrayal on many levels since Yuan Shao had been responsible for eliminating the eunuchs and creating the vacuum which allowed Dong Zhuo to take over. So, you can see why someone like Dong Zhuo, or Yuan Shao, would have been really motivated to really stick at the Dong Zhuo. The Battle of Hulao Gate that is attested in pretty much every Koei game that's ever happened, and also in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel, is fiction, but there was a battle at Sishui Gate. The reason we know this is not only that there is no historical battle at Hulao Gate, but also Hulao Gate did not exist yet. So, kind of presents a problem for having a battle there, doesn't it? Um, that battle was fairly uneventful, and in fact the main commander there on Dong Zhuo's behalf was Hu Jin assisted by Lu Bu, who led the cavalry, and then another junior officer named Hua Zhang, who was basically Hu Jin's second. But unlike in, hist unlike in fiction, um, historically speaking, Sun Jian was able to gain a, an easy victory. We'll talk about why that was the case. A lot of it has to do with Lu Bu being a scheming bastard. Um, it was an easy victory for Sun Jian. Hua, Hua Zhang does not really do much at all, other than get killed in the battle. He does not hold up the forces and force Guan Yu to go out to challenge him or anything like that. Historically, this was a cakewalk battle. And this helps decide Dong Zhuo that he needs to retreat from Luo Yang to Chang'an. That move occasions lots of resistance from his subordinates. But it, I think it actually was a solid move strategically. Because once he moves and devastates Luo Yang, the coalition is not able to really pursue him meaningfully, but he is able to strike at them. And basically what he's doing is biding his time waiting for them to go after each other. Because he realizes that they are also vicious, ambitious men. That they are not men of virtue who are solely concerned about the Han. That they are men much like himself. Men who are primarily focused on themselves. So that's what he does. He waits for them to fall apart and bides his time at Chang'an. In the meantime, however, a lot of his behaviors continue to antagonize the people around him, including one of his court officials, Wang Yung, who had been plotting against him anyway, but now was really pissed off that Dong Zhuo had come into his territory and had taken over his space. Not to mention Lu Bu, also becoming increasingly upset with Dong Zhuo. Especially Dong Zhuo's assertion that he can't get any of that imperial woman goodness to be had. So, uh, Dong is making a lot of enemies here, and it's not going well for him. So, um, Dong Zhuo effectively um, is holding on to the government. Most of the officers are content with his rule. And there's a chance that if he had survived longer, he might have been able to mount a counterattack out of the West and taken advantage of the division among the former coalition, which kind of fell apart once he went West out of reach. Because they had the logistics to hit him at Luoyang, but not further West. And they couldn't even occupy Luoyang once he abandoned it. So actually, his retreat from Luoyang, despite the fact that it's been widely criticized in pretty much every source, I think it actually strategically was pretty smart. Um, however, uh, Wang Yun and 
Lu Bu joined forces, they decided to kill him, and they pulled it off on June 22, 192. Thus, Dong Zhuo was killed, and the West was, for, was thrown in the chaos after that point. Evaluating Dong Zhuo was difficult. The tradition, both historical and fictional, is that he was a horrible, murderous tyrant. He did commit some murders, and he did certainly engage in tyranny over the court and over many people. But at the same time, was he really that different than a lot of his contemporaries? Most of the differences boil down to, as a general, Dong Zhuo was incompetent. He couldn't win battles. That was not something he could do. Politically, however, he was pretty savvy. And, again, given the time, given time and also if he had more loyal officers who might follow his commands, he actually could have made a comeback retaken Luoyang, and then moved east from there and possibly consolidated his hold in the empire. Had he lived longer, it's possible he could have pulled that off. I think that his abilities are somewhat underestimated because they are so uneven, and also because he is such a flawed man with obvious shortcomings. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that he had a large force under his command with some experience, and that some of the officers under him, at least when they had a commander to give them specific instructions, could be capable. A lot of these guys, when they were on their own, were completely moronic, but under a commander, they were pretty good. Um, it's also worth noting that he clearly did have at least some eye for talent. As we'll see, one of the men that he identified as being best used as a field commander was none other than Jia Zhu a man who would go on to really gain a reputation um, both under Zhang Zhu and later under Cao Cao. Overall, I would give Dong Zhuo a C. His talents are very uneven. Clearly, he has some major character flaws, but at the same time, this is someone who had some upsides as well. And, again, if he had lived longer and had more loyal officers, then he could have achieved quite a bit more. One, one other thing that told against him, though, is that he was getting older by 192, and also he was pretty fat. And, of course, that means that he could have just dropped dead of a heart attack, especially if he had gone on campaign. So, I don't think he would have really managed to reunify the Empire and set himself up as a dynast or anything like that. But it is possible that he could have prevented the Three Kingdoms period if he had been a little bit better of a general or had a better cast of subordinates. Alright, that's all I have for Dong Zhuo. Next up, we will move on to his younger brother, Dong Min. Alright, so, views are picking up. Uh, this is from, actually, Romance the Three Kingdoms 11. That was the only one I could find tonight in terms of face portraits, the pictures, I mean. All right, um, back to the list real fast. So Dong Min here is Dong Zhuo's younger brother. Dong Min was about 10 years younger than his brother, meaning that he was born sometime in the early 150s if Dong Zhuo was most likely born in the early 140s. He first emerges in the historical record in 189. He's actually at court at Luoyang rather than with his brother in the West. And he served as Commandant of Equipage. And in that capacity, he was in a position after Ho Jin's assassination to be one of the men who helped to go after one of the people who had been conspiring with the eunuchs. He put that person to death and gained a little bit of fame for doing that. Once his brother took command, he got promoted. He was in fief, so he became a Marquis. And... Um, he also was promoted all the way up to General of the Left, which is a fairly senior position. But despite the fact that Dong Zhuo was at war with all the warlords of the East, Dong Min did not really have a chance to distinguish himself. So, Dong Min commanded at a place called Mei. But once his brother was assassinated in 192, he didn't survive very long, as his position there was overrun. And what became significant about his position is that after his brother was killed, 
all of the rest of the Dong family went there to uh, take refuge behind the fortifications and get protection from Dong Min and his men. But naturally enough, the ambitious men who succeeded Dong Zhuo didn't want his command to become a family affair. So the city was stormed, and then Dong Min was killed along with the entire Dong family. Uh, just to give you an idea of how Dong Min is typically perceived, in Romance of the Three Kingdoms 13, the game, um, there's one scenario where if you make the wrong decisions as Dong Zhuo, then the assassination against you takes place, and after the smoke clears, Dong Min becomes the new head of the faction. And that's basically a punishment for making the wrong decision. Because Dong Min has pretty low ratings, and is certainly not capable of being a faction leader. So, um, he's someone who typically is not well regarded, and it's not hard to see exactly why. We don't really get a good sense of what he's capable of. And certainly as a man who's already in his early 40s by this point, you would think that Dong Zhuo would be willing to um, entrust him with much greater responsibilities. So the fact that he didn't means that there might have been something defective about this guy. So I rank Dong Min as an E. He can't pull off the F because he doesn't have a sort of signature failure. At the same time, he can't really go much higher because he didn't really do anything of note. Next up, we have another relative of Dong Zhuo, Dong Yue, also sometimes called Dong Zhue. We don't know how he was related to Dong Zhuo. It's possible he was a nephew. He might have been one of Dong Min's sons. He also could have been a cousin. We're not entirely sure. Or someone more distantly related than that, even. His job was being commander of the defenses at Mian Chi, which was somewhere in the region of Hong Nong to the east of Chang'an. Uh, so sort of on the road between Luoyang and Chang'an. Um, basically what happens is that as New Fu's army comes back from its big raid at Chen Lu, and they're moving to Chang'an after news of Dong Zhuo's death came, they visited with Dong Yue. And it would appear that Dong Yue... Uh, was trying to make common calls with them, maybe trying to get them to install him as the new leader. But instead, New Fu, who was Dong Zhuo's son-in-law, consulted one of his soothsayers, who then said that Dong Yue was a cursed man. And so, because Dong Yue was a very superstitious guy, he decided that Dong Yue must be bad luck and had him put to death. Later, it turned out that the soothsayer in question was a man who had been arrested and flogged by Dong Yue and was getting his revenge and taking advantage of his commander's eccentricities. <coughs> so, Dong Yue is unrateable. He never really got a chance to distinguish himself. And I guess to be fair to both Dong Min and Dong Yue, both of these guys are under a man who is deeply suspicious of others. And so they did not really get a good chance to shine, lest they should be more appealing to the men than Dong Zhuo himself. And now we'll do two retreads of men who appeared on the Yellow Turbans list, but assess them in the light of their service in this period. With the first Wang Yun, you can also consider this to be something of a corrections section from my last video on this topic. Wang Yun is very much worth revisiting because I've learned a lot more about him and about the details of the plot against Dong Zhuo. Wang Yun was born in 137, so he's not quite as old as he's made out to be. He's only in his 50s, not some really ancient man. He was known as a great scholar and also as an accomplished archer. When Dong Zhuo initially seized power. He confirmed that Wang Yun would be the senior magistrate in Chang'an. So Wang Yun was effectively the prefect of the city and was able to kind of do what he wanted. He did not really approve of Dong Zhuo, but he used his position to plot. So he began to make plans against Dong Zhuo. The story that I related last time about him giving Cao Cao the seven-star sword, that came from fiction. 
And also the birthday party where Wang Yun put on the waterworks to try to elicit sympathy was also part of fiction. The reality that this does reflect, however, is that both Wang Yun, um, is that Wang Yun from the very beginning was plotting against Dong Zhuo. By the time that Cao Cao left, his service, uh, Cao Cao was, uh, left the government that was at Luoyang. Dong Zhuo hadn't left yet. Wang Yun was involved in plotting, but he was plotting from afar, so there was no meeting between them, there was no birthday party at Luoyang, nothing like that. Wang Yun was back at Chang'an, plotting through correspondence. So, um, Wang Yun did try to launch a conspiracy with two bureaucrats at Luoyang, but that attempt on 190 failed. Later, after the coalition attacked, Dong Zhuo retreated to Chang'an, and he did so largely because he did not trust the government at Luoyang. He knew that this would be a much more defensible position out west. So Wang Yun is now probably under more pressure because he's an arch plotter, and now Dong Zhuo, the object of his plots, is closer at hand. So, Wang Yun now had to launch a plot closer at home, and a lot of this involved him and his assistants really uh, recruiting Lu Bu. By this point, the problems between Dong Zhuo and Lu Bu were well known. Uh, Lu Bu had been called out for banging women at court by Dong Zhuo, who thought that they were his women, and he had thrown a weapon or two at him, so Wang Yun had Lu Bu over for dinner. They talked and came to an understanding. There was no Diao Chan, by the way. Earlier I said that Diao Chan was the adopted daughter of Wang Yun. This was a made-up fiction by the novelist Lu Guanzhong, who wrote the Romance of the Three Kingdoms novel. So Diao Chan is sort of just an abstraction to represent the women that they were fighting over. In reality, it was a much larger group of women, not any particular woman, and certainly not any woman with a direct connection to Wang Yun. So, um, this time Wang Yun and Lu Bu made common cause, and they brought about the death of Dong Zhuo on June 22nd, 192. So, this was a pretty big event. Dong Zhuo was dead, and although Lu Bu is intimately involved in the new government, it is Wang Yun's government. Wang Yun is the senior official. Again, he's a man in his late 50s, he's got a lot of experience, he's a distinguished scholar, and he is able to rally the most supporters to his cause. However, he will now prove himself to be deeply inept at running a government. So you would think that in all these years he's been plotting, because he's been plotting for two or three years by this point, he would have a plan for when he takes command. He would have a clear vision for what he wants to do. But no, he does not. He has no idea what to do. So, first of all, one thing that he does is he has the opportunity to make common cause with a number of officers under him, the guys who've been under Dong Zhuo. But he doesn't really reach out to them. He kind of tries to send forces to seize them suddenly and eliminate them or take command with officers that he knows. He does not try to negotiate with people like Li Zhu. Even though, as we'll see later, Li Zhu was actually completely open to that possibility. But Wang Yun makes no effort to reach out. He also has some personal axes that he wants to grind. Now, one person he really hated was the court historian Kai Yang. Kai Yang was someone who was a better regarded scholar than himself and was responsible for overseeing the update of the Han history up to the year 168. This was a commission he received years before that had been long interrupted. But Kai Yang was very much more prestigious than Wang Yun. So Wang Yun has him arrested and then executed on the grounds that he is too favorable to Dong Zhuo. Um, after he orders the execution, he then realizes that he's done, he made a major mistake, that he's killed someone who's universally respected. So he tries to... Uh, override his order, the problem is that his override does not arrive in time and um, Kai Yong is executed. So now he is really 
made an ass of himself in front of the rest of the world. Everyone now sees Wang Yun as a tyrant. So he could have had a lot of prestige as a liberator, but now he's seen as a criminal, as a petty person who took a rivalry with another scholar way too far. So Kai Yong is now sort of a symbol throughout the Empire, and Wang Yun is a villain. And you might think that because he's so hostile to the other commanders and Dong Zhuo's officer corps, that he must have some army of his own to work with, but he doesn't. The army that he does have, he puts under Lu Bu. But whatever Lu Bu's abilities as a commander, he cannot overcome a vastly superior force. So Lu Bu is defeated by the forces of Li Zhu, and then when Li Zhu enters the capital, he has Wang Yun executed. In fiction, Wang Yun is represented as this sort of noble old man who's kind of sad about what's happening to the Han. He has this adoptive daughter who sacrifices her body in order to pull off her stepfather's great design. But in reality, Wang Yun was every bit as vicious as Dong Zhuo. And there's no reason to think that he was acting out of any kind of noble motivation. He was every bit the same as Dong Zhuo in terms of being self-serving and just ruthless. However, because of how incompetent he was once he took command, because he had no plan for after the assassination, I view him as being as bad or worse than Caesar's assassins who also had no plan. And so I rank him as an F. Also, if you don't like the rule of Li Zhu, who was profoundly incompetent, blame Wang Yun. Wang Yun easily could have made common cause with Li Zhu, and prevented Li Zhu from seizing power, but he didn't. It's possible that Wang Yun was motivated by some sort of snobbery. We don't know. I'd really like to know more about Wang Yun's motives, but unfortunately we don't know too much. Um, at any rate, though, he was very ineffective and did not really get much done. Next up, we have another revisit, and this is from Huang Fu Song. Now, Huang Fu Song, a couple weeks ago, we talked about him. He was one of the best, if not the best, Han general during the Yellow Turban Rebellion. However, we're going to focus on his relationship with Dong Zhuo. He had a number of occasions to oppose Dong Zhuo, and later to serve under him. And we'll see that he was much less effective at dealing with a potential tyrant than he was at putting down rebels. In 188, after his success against the Yellow Turbans, Huang Fu Song was sent west where he helped out Dong Zhuo. Dong Zhuo had failed against the Liang Revolt, he'd been struggling for three years, and now Huang Fu Song was appointed as, as his superior. Huang Fu Song figured out how to deal with the crisis at Chen Kang and launch a counterattack. He won the campaign. But Dong Zhuo opposed how he had done it because he had disregarded Dong's advice and had succeeded where Dong had failed. So Dong Zhuo held a grudge and created a crisis by refusing to hand over his men as ordered. When Huang, excuse me, Huang Fu turned over his men or uh, reported this to the court, they sent a formal reprimand to Dong but allowed him to keep his troops. So Huang Fu returned to court and let it go. All his subordinates this time were saying, dude, you need to step up and put a stop to Dong Zhuo. You need to put him in his damn place. And he didn't. Later on, and of course that left Dong Zhuo with 20,000 men he would not have had otherwise, so a huge advantage. So later on, Dong Zhuo did seize power in 190 and put a new emperor on the throne. Well, Huang Fu Song at this time was in command of the army at the capital, and he had about 30,000 men under his command. He also, as the most successful general of the most recent war, had a lot of prestige. So if he had stood up and said no to Dong Zhuo, that could have stopped the whole thing right there. He doesn't, though. And because of that, Dong Zhuo was able to take command. Huang Fu did not act because he didn't think it was appropriate. He thought it was 
a use of influence that he should not be exercising. His peers were so pissed at him for not going after Dong that they started a trial and almost convicted him and executed him for his role before Huang Fusong's son intervened and stopped the execution. So Dong Zhuo just like sat back and watched while a guy who was helping him was getting excoriated by others. Later on, as he retreated to Chang'an, uh, Dong Zhuo then appointed Huang Fusong to be the head of the censors. And he sort of chided Huang Fusong, or teased him, I should say, about his demotion, and Huang Fusong just kind of took it in good humor. Um, Huang Fu continued to serve under Dong Zhuo until his assassination in 192, and then he played a role in the governments of both Wang Yun and Li Zhu. By this point, he was kind of one of those grand old men of the empire figures. He was a capable and loyal officer, but also, of course, he was getting older and his energy was declining. I'm really not sure what his motives were during this period or if he simply failed to understand that things had changed irrevocably and that it was no longer possible to succeed through sheer virtue and sheer service. That the men like Dong Zhuo got where they were going because they realized that the Han court had lost its way and really lost its legitimacy. One thing that is worth exploring is the degree to which Huang Fu Song's continued adherence to Dong Zhuo is evidence that maybe Dong Zhuo had more respect than we realize. That the historical tradition has been very unkind to him but that people at the time were not necessarily quite as hostile. Because Huang Fu Song was clearly willing to go to war with people he regarded as enemies of the regime, as evidenced by his use as the main commander during the Yellow Turban Rebellion. So the fact that he doesn't oppose Dong Zhuo implies that perhaps there's something about Dong Zhuo that we're missing. We don't know, though. It's hard to say. Here, I'm not going to try to overanalyze Huang Fu Song's decisions. Of course, we don't really know exactly why he does what he does. So instead, I will assume that he is a capable but ultimately weak and tired man who just lets Dong Zhuo get away with literal murder in some cases. Um, and again, to be fair to Huang Fu Song, it's not so much that he's weak as that he's old. He dies in 195, just three years after Dong Zhuo passes away himself. And so Huang Fu Song, by the time that Dong Zhuo takes over, was probably past his best and not really quite the man he had been in the mid-180s. So uh, we have to also keep age in mind when we're talking about this kind of stuff because age and health are very closely linked. And if someone is no longer uh, able-bodied when something goes down, then maybe they won't quite respond to it the way that they would if they were full of vim and vigor. That being said, um, I have to rate Huang Fu Song as an E. He was rather ineffective and feckless during this whole affair. And he ultimately was an enabler of Dong Zhuo, whether he wanted to be or not. here make sure everything's good to go okay everything is still good to go cool all right next up we have Dong Zhuo's son-in-law Niu Fu now this man is fucking weird Niu Fu is the one of the more eccentric officers I've read about, period. And at this point, I've read about quite a few of these guys, but this guy was pretty out there. I guess of all the people we'll discuss today, he's the closest to being a religious fanatic. Somehow he managed to marry Dong Zhuo's daughter, and uh, so he was set for life. But despite his many oddities, it's easy to understand why Dong Zhuo would turn to him because this man seems to have been loyal 
And despite all of the weirdnesses that he had, he, he was a capable commander. The few battles that we see him in, he does win. So, not hard to see why Dong Zhuo would turn to a guy who's loyal and wins battles. Uh, that being said, Nu Fu is a guy who was not quite okay. We'll discuss. So, among his other eccentricities, he had a nervous, unsteady temperament where he would massively overreact to things, which of course is not what you want in a high-level commander. So, that would have been a problem, especially, say, it, in the situation I outlined earlier, where Dong Zhuo is not assassinated in 192, and he counterattacks a couple years later. If Nu Fu is one of his major commanders, then who knows what he would have done. Um, at one point, after Dong Zhuo was dead, Nu Fu will kill one of Dong Zhuo's relatives on the grounds that his soothsayer said that the man was... Uh, had ill omens about him, or a bad energy. So, Nu Fu says, well, good enough for me, put that motherfucker to death. So this is someone who has character flaws you can drive a tr uh, nitroglycerin truck through, and not hit any walls. I mean, the gaps in this man's character are pretty severe. In 189, his first success was fighting some bandits in Heidong, which he did successfully. Later on in 192, he leads the famous raid to Chen Lu. Um, so this was a deep operation. He set out from his position to the east of Chang'an, west of Luoyang. And remember, Luoyang had been burned down, so getting provisions was not easy, but he still manages to take a large army, get pretty far east, raid Chen Lu, which was Cao Cao's hometown, and then escaped successfully while keeping his men in supply. So someone who was militarily competent is what I'm getting at. This was not some sort of moron we're dealing with. Um, his first knowledge, as far as we know, of his father-in-law's death is that when his army was returning and was nearing its base, they were suddenly attacked by a force under Li Su. Uh, one of the generals of Wang Yun and Lu Bu. Uh, Nu Fu was able to defeat this attack. Later on, there is a mutiny. We don't know exactly why the men in his army were in mutiny. It probably had to do with something mundane, such as harsh discipline or low pay or bad food, whatever it might be. But Nu Fu, being paranoid and superstitious, assumed that it was much, much worse than it was. So he turned to one of his bodyguards and he said, I'm being plotted against, everyone's out to get me, I will reward you richly if you protect me. But his bodyguard apparently thought he was a douchebag and said, okay, I'm going to go get that reward then. So he killed Nu, nu Fu, took his head to Chang An, and turned it over to Wang Yun. And effectively, that is why the army was left leaderless and Li Zhu was able to take command and then ultimately use that army to seize full power. Because Li Zhu was not that senior at the time. But the death of Niu Fu put him in a position to take command. That also, of course, raises the issue of whether Li Zhu was on this somehow. It doesn't appear so. And also, Li Zhu is kind of dumb, so he would not be able to figure out something this complex. This was pure luck. Uh, Niu Fu is one of those guys, clearly he did have ability, but this was offset to a large extent by his extreme eccentricities, and while he could win battles, and he was capable of a lot of things, I think his flaws are too great for him to have ever been mounted to much. I say an independent warlord. So had he succeeded Dong Zhuo, my prediction is that ultimately there still would have been a major civil war in Chang'an, that he would have managed to offend or alienate someone, or get himself assassinated, and then lead to a civil war between the claimants. Overall, I will give Nu Fu a B for his performance as a Dong Zhuo officer. But I can't really go any higher than that because he doesn't have enough deeds. I can't go lower because all of the various personal failings he had never quite had a chance to really manifest themselves and create havoc. Okay. Next up we have Zhang Ji. 
And I think I got the right Zhang Ji, but I'm not sure because there were multiple options picture-wise. When I tried to click on the profiles, the profiles showed up in either Chinese or Japanese, so I didn't know what the fuck they said. Uh, but there are multiple people from this period named Zhang Ji and Zhang Zhu. And also it's worth noting that uh, the, na the surname Zhang was easily the most common in China at this time, at least among figures who became generals in the Three Kingdoms period. So Zhang Ji, this one, as opposed to the Wei general who arose later, was an officer of Dong Zhuo, and it's not quite clear when he joined up. Most likely he was already serving by 192, but um, there's also a possibility he was a fairly late comer. He's first attested in 192 when he recruits his relative Zhang Zhu, or maybe this is slightly before 192. Later on, he accompanies a raiding party led by Nu Fu, the one that struck at Chen Lu. So he's with this army. On the way back, they learn that Dong Zhuo had been assassinated. During the mutiny, uh, Li Zhu then claims command afterwards. And Zhang Ji would help Li Zhu seize power in Chang'an. He would then be rewarded for his efforts by being granted command at Hong Nong to the east. So he basically was sort of the frontier guardian of the new regime. So he kind of took up where a lot of Dong Zhuo's men had been. Later on, after the government at Chang'an sort of came into conflict, um... Zhang Ji traveled to Chang'an to try to broker peace between Li Zhu and Guo Xi. That was a fool's errand, however, as those men were not to be reconciled. And so, Zhang Ji decided to help the Emperor Xi'an escape, lest he be killed in the street fighting. So he's responsible for getting Xi'an out of there. But then it turns out that Zhan didn't want to go to Zhang Ji's camp and wait out the turmoil in the capital, but rather to escape deeper east. So realizing that he had been played, Zhang Ji then went to both Li Zhu and Guo Xi and said, guys, we need to patch our differences and capture the emperor. So the three of them now work together to try to capture the emperor. They failed horribly. And the man left the most in the lurch was Zhang Ji, whose pursuit force was trapped in an area without supplies when winter fell, and uh, a lot of them died, including their commander, Zhang Ji. Luckily for Zhang Ji, he had made a very close friend in his kinsman, Zhang Zhu, who had looked after his widow, and his plight really inspired the empathy of Lu Biao, one of the major warlords in Jing province, who then invited Zhang Ji and his followers to join him since he knew at this point that Li Zhu would be hostile and would not help, and almost certainly would come after him. Uh, Zhang Ji was dead, though, so his troops, now under the command of Zhang Zhu, did go to join Lu Biao. And we'll get to Zhang Zhu in a minute, but in the meantime, we have to rank Zhang Ji. To me, Zhang Ji is a C. He's alright. He doesn't really do anything special. Part of that is because he doesn't have the opportunity and he's held back by the stupidity of Li Zhu. After that, of course, we have Zhang Zhu. I've read some accounts where he is listed as a nephew of Zhang Ji. I'm not sure exactly how precise that is, though. Zhang Zhu is someone who had a fascinating career, full of twists and turns. He was a junior official in Liang when the, when the revolt uh, originally broke in the 180s. And then when the rebel leader, uh, Ku Sheng, killed his governor, Zhang Zhu and some other officials rallied some locals, set up an ambush, and avenged their governor. And this gained him a lot of local fame, because he was seen as a man of action rather than a man of words, a man who was willing to take things in his own hands and get results. And in general, Zhang Zhu does seem to have been a fairly charismatic guy. When Dong Zhuo came to power later on, sometime around 189, 190, uh, Zhang Zhu decided to join Zhang Ji in service. 
It's most likely he was recruited by his kinsmen. They became very close over the years, and of course Zhang Zhu would eventually agree to look after Zhang Ji's widow in the event of his death. A charge he took very, very seriously, by the way. When Dong Zhuo was assassinated, Zhang Zhu rode with Li Zhu's army and played a pretty big part in retaking Chang'an. And he was offered rewards for his services because he was one of the guys who distinguished himself, but he declined a number of them and decided to stay with Zhang Ji at Hong Nong as a subordinate. So he could have gotten his own command easily, but he decided not to. Later on, when Emperor Zhang escaped to the east, uh, Zhang Zhu seems to have accompanied the force that went after them, uh, that was commanded by Zhang Ji, and when his kinsmen died, he took command, and then tried to lead them to safety. It was at this time that the invite from Lu Biao arrived, which was addressed to Zhang Ji, but Zhang Zhu apparently decided to answer it in his own name and was able to secure a position at Wan Castle, where he became the new commandant. It was now in this position that he would be there to face Cao Cao in 197. However, Cao Cao was too powerful, so initially, Zhang Zhu surrendered. He didn't want to waste his men's lives on a pointless defense. But eventually, he decides that he has to resist because he receives two pieces of news. One is that um, Zhang Zhi's widow is now having an affair with Cao Cao. The other piece of news is that Cao Cao is plotting to kill Zhang Zhu. Uh, so Zhang Zhu decides to preempt him and launches an attack at Wan Castle. But that's something that we'll revisit when we talk about the Wei officers, because Zhang Zhu, despite this hostile introduction to Cao Cao, will go on to be a fairly reliable officer for him, despite really fucking him over at Wan Castle pretty hard. But we'll cover all of that at a later date. I have to give Zhang Zhu a B. Uh, he was pretty effective for what he did. Um, that being said, he did not have as many opportunities as one would have thought. Um, but of course, he was someone who did have significant ability. He just wasn't employed enough to fully utilize it. Now we move on to Jia Zhu an officer who is now playable in the Dynasty Warriors games. Someone who really, uh... Um, I don't know what happened to the audio. Let me... Hold on. Did that fix it? I just plugged it in and plugged it out. I don't know what hap what makes it work that way. I don't understand the problem. I mean, mic issues are very much a deeply technical thing. I don't understand them at all. But did that do the trick? Okay. Alright, I, I don't know what it is. I, um, I suspect part of the problem, either the mic itself, which is two years old now, might be going bad... I don't know how long they're supposed to last, or maybe the USB port is going bad. I mean, one of those two things could be the case, because I used to not have these issues, so I don't know. Um, I just kind of guess as best I can, and hope for the best. Um, okay, so, back to the list. Now we're looking at Jia Zhu. So most of his significance will actually come later in his career when he's an older man working under Zhang Zhu and Cao Cao. But despite the fact that most of his achievements come when he's already, I think, 45 plus, so most of his achievements are when he's in his 50s and 60s, he still has an interesting early career. He was born in 147, which means he's actually older than a lot of the more famous men of this period. And he's definitely what we'd call a late bloomer. 
as a young man, for whatever reason, perhaps he was a bit of an, of an introvert, he was not noticed as a man of ability until about 170 when he's already 23. And then one of the talent scouts noted that he was very filial and incorrupt. So they'd have different assessments they could give in terms of what type of man someone was. So he was named filial, filial and incorrupt, meaning that he's someone who is loyal to uh, his family and also is not prone to corruption. And then he was finally able to go to the Imperial Capital as a cadet. He got there, worked a few years, thought it sucked. So then he uh, either legitimately fell ill or feigned illness and was then traveling home. And when he's traveling home, he, a group of rebels fell upon his party, killed most of the men in it, but spared him because he was able to spin a yarn, the quick-thinking fellow that he was, and tell them that he is a relative of one of the famous frontier generals named Duan Zhang. So his captors then had a vested interest in keeping him alive, lest this general come after them, or lest they missed out on some sort of big payday. So Jia Ju was able to survive this incident that none of his colleagues did. Later on, he had returned to the capital, working quietly as a bureaucrat, when Dong Zhuo took power in 189. By this point, Jia Zhu is 42 years old, and it would appear that his specialty is working in the bureaucracy. And then he has this one cool story of the time that he evaded death by being quick thinking. But perhaps he still had grander ambitions, and certainly Dong Zhuo saw in him greater abilities. So Dong Zhuo plucked him out of the office and then put him in the field as a commander. And ultimately, the reason why we still know who Jia Zhu is owes to Dong Zhuo's decision to put him in the field, because he would gain enough clout in this period to then become a major commander under Cao Cao and become more noteworthy. When Dong Zhuo was assassinated in 192, excuse me, he was um, in New Fu's army, and he became more influential once his commander was assassinated, because people looked to Jia Zhu as a voice of reason. He was a little older than a lot of his contemporaries, a lot of the other commanders we'll talk about from this incident, and he's also much more level-headed and sober. So they looked to him for sage advice. One piece of advice that he gave, and it's kind of surprising that it had to come from him, is when Jia, when uh, Li Zhu closes in on Wang Yun's position, Li Zhu is intimidated. Because again, he had wanted to surrender to Wang Yun and join him as an officer, and then Wang Yun had refused, so he didn't know exactly what was happening in the capital. But Jia Zhu correctly read the situation and said, Okay, Wang Yun is not strong, we can just overrun him. So we need to... Find our courage, just overrun him, take the capital, and it's ours. So Jia Zhu wins the day argumentatively, and then Li Zhu's forces attack and win very easily. At this point, he probably could have claimed up the second or third in command, but he decides not to. Instead, he decides to hang back and be more of a behind-the-scenes guy, more of an advisor. And the one position he does retain is as the gentleman who can oversee appointments. Um, so at first, things are fine with Li Zhu. Li Zhu's not exactly a genius of any kind, but things are okay in the capital. They're stable. Li Zhu parties too much and he's an idiot, but, you know, whatever. But then, by 195, problems are really starting to crop up. In 194, you have a major invasion from the west, led by uh, Han Sui. You also have more revolts. You have a mutiny in Chang'an. Uh, so things are getting pretty bad, and then you have Li Zhu's decision to execute Fan Chao, which we'll get to later. At this point, the general Guo Xi revolts, and now Chang'an is in full civil war. Many of the men of conscience decide to leave the city, but Jia Zhu decides to stay in order to really try to diminish the evil coming from Li Zhu, who's willing to do anything to retain command. He's willing to kill anyone or resort to any dirty deed he needs to do to win. Uh, one of the steps that Jia Zhu takes early on is to try to recruit uh, the former Han general Zhu Jun, but that 
while he does get him to come and shang on, that doesn't really do anything. Um, later on, once the fighting becomes general in the streets, uh, Jia Ju does manage to convince the Chiang inhabitants of the capital to leave. So these are non-Han people from the frontier. So they avoid getting massacred. So Jia Ju does save their lives. And later on, when Li Zhu will capture officers who had defected the Guo Si, uh, Jia Ju was able to intervene and managed to save some more lives. So basically he was there for mostly uh, humanitarian reasons, but ultimately he does tire of Li Zhu's stupidity. Later, when uh, Li Zhu and Guo Si make common cause to go try to get the Emperor back, uh, Jia Ju goes with them, and he decides to stay with one of the frontier commanders named Duan Wei. However, uh, Duan Wei's men decided that they liked Jia Ju better than they liked Duan Wei. And that was despite having been Duan Wei's men since 191. So Duan Wei starts to become jealous and Jia Ju realizes that this is dangerous. So he links up with Zhang Zhu, who had now taken command at Wan. And he visits and enters the service of Zhang Zhu. Although apparently he did leave his family in Duan Wei's hands when he went. I don't know if he ever got them back or not. But um, at any rate, we see that Jia Zhu is someone who's very capable. By 197, he's in a position to match his wits against Cao Cao. And as we'll see, as Zhang Zhu's primary advisor, he does extremely well. Then later on, enters Cao Cao's command and continues to really kick ass and take names. For me, Jia Zhu, even in this early period, is an A. And this is based on fairly limited opportunity. Had Li Zhu been smart enough to just follow Jia Zhu's advice consistently, he might have lasted a lot longer and done a lot better. But as it was, he let his more vicious instincts take command, and he let a man of talent escape. So huge fuck up on the part of Li Zhu. And now we'll get to two men who are vastly overrated in the historical tradition, or really in the fictional tradition, because historically they didn't do that much. So check to make sure everything's good to go here. Uh, buh, 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 buh. Vigia. So that... So yeah, in the games, I think he's rated pretty fair. And then the next man is... Alright, so now we're on to Li Ru. Now in fiction, especially in the early 2000s Koei games, such as Dynasty Warriors 3... Li Ru and Li Su are represented as being very high up in Dong Zhuo's hierarchy and sort of being the guys whispering in his ears. In reality, however, neither of these men had that much influence. We'll start with Li Ru. In 190, at this time, uh, Dong Zhuo had just deposed the Emperor Xiao and replaced him with his younger brother, Xian. And Li Ru's job was to be the senior advisor to the deposed Emperor. So, basically, he's holding an office that no longer means jack shit. And now he gets an order that will make it mean even less. So, Dong Zhuo sends Li Ru a secret order where he is to issue the former emperor with poison and make sure that he is taken out of contention. Li Ru complied with this order and then told the ex-emperor that if he would take this potion, if he would drink this drink, then all of his troubles would end. Of course, this worked. Emperor Xiao dies. And now Dong Zhuo's decision to appoint his younger brother is confirmed and irreversible. However, that is all we know that Li Ru did. He appears in history to kill the guy he's uh, um, supposed to be advising. And then he vanishes. That's it. That's all he does. So that makes him unrankable, I think. We don't know how he felt about this. We don't know what his motives were. 
he has no other in- instances where he had an opportunity to really show anything, so I can't really rank him based on that. Um, and I don't know what happened to him after this. So we don't know whether he decided to go home because he was troubled by what happened or whether he entered service somewhere else, whether he served in the field. We don't know. So. And next up is Li Su. Um, this man was an officer of Dong Zhuo. And while he also is frequently portrayed in a lot of the Koei games as being a senior commander at, say, the fictional battle of Hulao Gate, in reality, he does not seem to have been particularly military. Although he did command troops. So, he's first attested during the plot against Dong Zhuo in June 192. He was on the side of Wang Yun and Lu Bu. After the successful assassination, Lu Bu sort of becomes the new commander of the army, and this is a fairly small army, by the way, under Wang Yun, and Li Su is put in command of kind of a vanguard unit, which is sent out to try to intercept Nu Fu's army, whether he had some sort of edict or whatever it was, try to kick command, or whether he was just trying to surprise the camp, we don't know. But his job was to go out and head off this incoming army. In this task, he failed horribly. His surprise attack was detected. He was repulsed. Once he came back to the capital defeated, Lu Bu decided to put him to death for failure. So, Li Su is an E. The task he was given was a stupid one. He failed. Not entirely his fault. Um, And this is yet further evidence that Lu Bu was a man of a very harsh temperament who was not suited to higher command. Next up we have the aforementioned Duan Wei. So Duan Wei was the man that Jia Ju spent some time with before he went to Wan. And by the way, Duan Wei is spelled exactly like Dion Wei, except instead of Dion, D-I-A-N, it would be D-U-A-N. So his position was a defensive post south of the Wei River in the Hongnong region. And this was one of the posts set up to protect Chang'an from advances from the east. He took up this position in 191 and would hold it all the way until 198. So he was a long-serving officer who neither sought nor received promotion. In 192, when there was that struggle after after Dong Zhuo's assassination, it would appear that Duan Wei stayed out of it. So he didn't really get himself involved in that at all, so far as I know. Um, Later on in 195, he did get involved in the fleeing of the Emperor Xi'an. Uh, One of the men near Xi'an contacted Duan Wei and won his adhesion, so he did not cooperate with Li Zhu and Guo Xi. Later on, of course, he did take in Jia Zhu, who wanted to stay with him. They they butted heads a bit. He got rid of him. Um, But this does mean that Duan Wei was able to actually defy his nominal superiors, Li Zhu and Guo Xi, both of whom were number one and number two, respectively, in the new regime at Chang'an. And he got away with it. They never came after him after 195. So a few years passed, and no one came after him. That's interesting. Emperor Xi'an managed to make the three men reconcile as he was escaping. There were some running battles. Uh, So ultimately, the emperor would escape and then get captured by Cao Cao. Later on, Cao Cao would send an agent with an imperial decree back through this area to try to overthrow the weakened Li Zhu. This would be in 198. And the first man to defect to his side with troops was Duan Wei. So Duan Wei joined with his troops, and with the other local commanders, they marched on Chang'an, deposed and murdered Li Zhu in 198, thus adding Chang'an to Cao Cao's domains for free. Uh, He was in fee for his efforts, entered Cao Cao's service, held an officer too, he hung out at court, uh, and then died of natural causes in 209. So, the rest of his career, the remaining 11 years or so, was pretty uneventful. And while he did technically become a way officer, I didn't really count him because he didn't do that much. 
And he's basically the definition of a quiet pro who does his job and nothing more. And ultimately held out for the best offer to sell out and then got it, wrote it, won. Uh, Duan Wei is a C for me. He's alright. He did what he needed to do, got the most out of it, but uh, didn't really do anything too interesting. Next up we have Hu Jin. So Hu Jin is one of the legit senior commanders under Dong Zhuo. In 191, he was dispatched with 5,000 men to attack Sun Jian. So basically he was sort of a vanguard commander. While, and that's also the role that Sun Jian played for the coalition. Uh, Hu Jin was supposed to be supported by the cavalry under the command of Lu Bu. But the two of them feuded as they were marching out and trying to figure out a battle plan. And so Hu, uh, Lu Bu began to plot against Hu Jin and started spreading a bunch of rumors throughout the ranks. And this spread dissension so that by the time Hu Jin attacked Sun Jian's forces, he was fairly demoralized. And also Lu Bu did not materialize to support the attack as agreed. So Hu Jin launched an unsupported attack. It failed horribly. And he got routed by Sun Jian. Later on in 192, after everybody relocated to the west, um, he was not one of the men who wanted to join with Li Zhu. And a lot of these guys only waited until after Li Zhu had seized Chang An before they decided that Li Zhu was not going to be their liege. So he joins with Zhu Rong, who almost certainly was the senior guy that others were rallying around. And then they marched on Chang An and joined battle to the east of the city. Uh, Zhu Rong was killed in action, and that's really what decided the battle. So Hu Jin was on the losing side, and he managed to surrender to Li Zhu and join his ranks. He became the director of retainers at Chang An, and then entered into a personal feud with a man named Yu Yin who is a pretty minor guy, probably some minor scholar, official. Um, he had Yu Yin arrested and executed, but then within a few months, he became terminally ill. So he decided that this must be his payback for behaving the way he had. And so on his deathbed, he admitted that he had been wrong to pursue Yu Yin in this way. And also he said that his death was caused by Yu Yin's avenging spirit. Uh, Hu Zen is hard to evaluate. I give him an E, though. I feel like he was fairly ineffectual. A lot of that's not his fault. But when he does have a fairly open hand, fairly free hand to do what he wants, he pursued a private grievance, which to me suggests that the man was immature and unworthy of greater power. So he would not have been someone who would have made a positive difference if he had lived to 195 when... Li Zhu and Guo Xi went to war with one another. And now we'll look at one of Hu Jin's subordinates, a man who in fiction became massively overrated, and that is Huai Zhang. Now, if any of you have played the Koei games, especially Dynasty Warriors, you will recall that at Sishui Gate, or sometimes at Hulao Gate, depending on the game, the coalition forces will be stymied by a man named Hua Zhang, uh, who will defeat Sun Jian and multiple champions, and basically the council will meet in despair about who can take down this beast of a man in personal combat. And that's where Guan Yu offers his services, Sao Tso has to vouch for him, and then he goes out and wins fame by killing the mighty Hua Zhang. Historically, however, Hua Zhang was not a warrior. He was a senior administrator with Dong Zhuo, and he became the second in command of Hu Jin's force of 5,000, the vanguard, at Sui Shui Gate. What happened was the force attacked Sun Jian, became disordered, and got routed pretty easily. And in the ensuing chaos, while Hu Jin did escape, Hua Zhang was not that lucky and ended up dying in action. 
probably not at the hands of an officer. He probably just got killed by some rando, and that was it. I have no idea why Wu Guangzhou decided to make Hua Zhang into such a big deal, but he did. So in fiction, Hua Zhang is this great warrior who first shows what he's got at Hulao Gate. In reality, of course, Hulao Gate did not exist yet, and Hua Zhang uh, was just some random bureaucrat. I find his elevation to heroic status to be somewhat comical, since historically we have no evidence that he really achieved anything at all. I'd give Hua Zhang an E. Uh, he's not really an impactful individual at all. Let's check. Let's make sure we're still good. Alright, cool. Everything's still dece ish Alright. Next up, we have Zhu Rong. Um, what's interesting is that historically, the battles between Dong Zhu and the coalition were not very intense or long-lasting. In fiction, these are some of the most important battles ever fought. But in reality, these battles were pretty anticlimactic. And once the position became tenuous, Dong Zhuo decided to retreat to Chang'an because he knew his opponents did not have the logistics to reach that far west and that their coalition would fall apart without him being nearby. Once again, it was a pretty solid strategy and it worked. Um, but one commander who did meet and do well against the coalition commanders was Zhu Rong. And, in fact, not only did he win once, but he won twice. He defeated both Sun Jian and Cao Cao in two separate battles, in 190 and 191, respectively. Surprisingly, he was actually still alive in 192, but for whatever reason, despite the fact that he was easily the most accomplished general in the faction, he was not really seen as a potential successor. And he also seems to have been more than willing to work with Wang Yun. So in fact, he teamed up with Hu Jin, and the two of them decided to challenge Li Zhu on behalf of Wang Yun. Uh, based on the chronology, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest with you, if the battle between the anti-Li Zhu officers uh, occurred after Wang Yun was defeated or while Wang Yun was still ostensibly in power. But Zhu Rong decided to join the cause of the men who were anti-Li Zhu, and during the battle he was killed in action, his men lost. Of course, his colleague Hu Jin joins up with Li Zhu. Um, it's worth stating, uh, of all the men who served under Dong Zhuo against the coalition, only one of them really showed out and did well, and that was Zhu Rong. Everybody else sucked. Everybody else was ass. No one else did anything, or, I mean, if they served at all. So, um, for that reason alone, I have to give Zhu Rong an honorary A. Uh, and I assume that a lot of his failure against Li Zhu is not so much that he was outgeneraled as that he got unlucky and got wounded. Now, if there were more details of that battle and how he lost, I would have to reevaluate. But the fact that he managed to beat both Sun Jian and Cao Cao, both of whom are very well-regarded commanders, means that this guy was not a scrub. And that he must have gotten unlucky in the Civil War, rather than um, being outgeneraled. So, a lot of that uh, potential scenario where Dong Zhuo survives and goes on to achieve great things depends upon the survival and continued well-being of Zhu Rong who was really his only accomplished commander. Because as we'll see, even the bigger names like Lu Bu, eh, they're not that great at military stuff, as far as we know. Okay. Moving on to Dong Cheng. So Dong Cheng, I believe we did cover last time briefly, but um, he was not related to Dong Zhuo, but rather to the Dowager Empress Dong. So he was a, an in-law, an uncle to the Emperor Jian. He also entered Dong Zhuo's service under the command of Niu Fu. 
But then when Jian decided to go east after Chang'an turned into a war zone, he accompanied his nephew. He initially escorted the emperor to Luoyang and wanted to re-establish shop there, but the city was still a wreck. So he was persuaded by Cao Cao to relocate to Zhu Chang. Um, after some initial resistance to Cao Cao, they reconciled. And basically, Cao Cao allowed him to pursue his career, not knowing that Zhang Chang was still plotting against him. So, Dong Chang decided to really double down on his adhesion to his own nephew, Jian, creepily placing his own daughter in the harem. So yes, the young emperor Jian, as he came of age, had the option of having sex with his first cousin, who was now a member of his harem. Don't think about that too much, but think about it a little bit. So, that happened. And Dong Cheng was responsible on the Emperor's behalf for plotting against Cao Cao. However, he was detected and executed in 200. So as a follower of Dong Zhuo, we have to rate him separately. Um, I mean, he's basically a traitor to Dong Zhuo. Because he doesn't protect Dong Zhuo's son-in-law. And as soon as the Emperor Jian starts to revolt, uh, he's all about that and helps him get to the east. He wasn't really in a position to do F-level damage, so I'll have to go with an E. Um, doesn't really achieve much, but clearly was not an asset to the administration. Now we'll look at another man who is almost certainly related to Dong Zhuo, a man who is so minor that he never gets a portrait in Koei games, Dong Huang. We don't know how he's related to Dong Zhuo. He might have been a nephew, might have even been a son of Dong Zhuo. But he was a non-entity. We don't know much about the guy. Other than that, as soon as Dong Zhuo was dead, he quickly followed him to the grave. Um, if he is a son of Dong Zhuo, he must have been very young, as in a teenager. Otherwise, he would have been more senior, and more people would have flocked to him as a potential successor. Um, either that, or he was just incompetent in, to a degree that no one would want to work with him. But most likely, it's just that the guy was very, very young. And it's also possible that he was not a son or nephew, but maybe more of a cousin. So he was not really someone who was a viable stalking horse. Um, anyway, he doesn't really do much except get killed. He's a U. And now we'll look at Lu Bu. So that's right, guys. Lu Bu is coming. All right. Uh, we've got a quick super chat from Mantis42. Thank you, sir. He says, would love to see you do a tier list of Three Kingdoms Media, my recommendation of the Taiwanese film War God, where a giant Guan Yu fights Martians? Wow. That's fucked up. That could be interesting. I have not seen the Chinese series Three King of uh, the Three Kingdoms that came out like 10 years ago, because I don't want to watch something that's 89 episodes with a bunch of subtitles, but uh, I have seen a lot of Three Kingdoms Media, mostly from Koei. I also need to play the Three Kingdoms game. Um, uh, the Total War game, I mean. But yeah, uh, that's something I could do in the future is Three Kingdoms Media because there's a lot of it. Um, I have seen one of those, uh, at least a couple of those movies about the Battle of the Red Cliffs. Those are interesting. Um, but yeah, I, that's something I could do in the future, maybe after all this is finished and I have time to actually view a lot of that media because, um, like I said, some of it's pretty lengthy. And uh, to view something like that, I'd probably have to talk my girlfriend into it. Uh, but I don't know if she'd be open to that or not. Because she typically is not a big fan of things with subtitles. And she's also not familiar with The Three Kingdoms, despite dating me for five years at this point. But, you know, we'll uh, work on that, you know. Every relationship's a work in progress, right? So, yeah. We'll introduce her to the Three Kingdoms. Could be fun. Alright. 
Next up is Lubu. So it's worth noting right off the bat that Lubu is not the guy he's portrayed as in the games. Lubu is not an idiot. He's not just some brute who uses sheer force to overcome people. If anything, he would be someone who has that kind of arrogance, but most likely was more of a smartass who was a really good tactician. Even maybe a good strategist, but not someone who's good at getting along with people. I mean, not to put too fine of a point on it, but Lubu was a massive asshole. So that part the games get right. Lubu was extremely arrogant and someone who was completely self-serving. But he's not an idiot. And he's also not someone who was like a mountain of a man and was invincible. In fact, none of these guys were that. Um, Guan Yu, Zhang Fei, the rest, none of them were invincible warriors. Duels were known but not common. So in fact, Lu Bu, who now because of the Romance of the Three Kingdoms is known as the greatest warrior to ever live, so far as we know, he only ever fought one duel in his entire life. Yes, that's right, one. Count him up, one. And that was when he had to fight Guo Si during a civil war. So we already mentioned how he sees power alongside of Wang Yun. Well, he was trying to cut his way out after uh, the forces came after him under uh, Li Zhu and Guo Si. So he fought a duel against Guo Si, did not kill him, but did wound him, and then managed to break away in the ensuing chaos. So Lu Bu, he was decent at arms, but this man is not some sort of monster. He's not the Michael Jordan of dueling. He's just somebody who's pretty good with the sword or spear, but no, nothing extraordinary by any means. As we already mentioned at the outset, he also never had any relation with Dao Chan, who never existed, but he loved women. Um, Lu Bu was a womanizer extraordinaire. When he became, uh, he first served under Ding Yuan and uh, became his adopted son at one point. Ding Yuan was the leader of a small community in the northwest or northeast of China uh, on the frontier. So Lu Bu did well in his service, won his trust. Lu Bu seems to have had a good amount of charisma. But then uh, he betrayed Ding Yuan, killed him, and went to serve under Dong Zhuo. And by the way, uh, apparently Zhang Liao was also pretty close with Ding Yuan and was still willing to follow Lu Bu when he murdered Ding Yuan. So that's the kind of charisma we're talking about with Lu Bu, at least early in his career. But he also had a very well-developed cruel streak, as we'll see. And he was prone to paranoia. So, basically, um, Lu Bu, as we mentioned, when he first took command, it was as a cavalry guy in support of Hu Jin. But once he and Hu Jin started butting heads, he basically just decided to spread a bunch of rumors about Hu Jin and then leave him in the lurch against Sun Jian, ensuring that Hu Jin got massively beaten. Um, so this is a guy who can be a backstabber, and rather than just being this force of nature, who just brute forced everything, he actually was kind of passive-aggressive and a scheming dick. Uh, so he let that happen. Later on, he returns to the capital, and just like his master... Dong Zhuo, he decides to avail himself of the talent at the palace, who are supposed to be reserved for the emperor, but the emperor is a boy, so he's not really uh, taking advantage of that resource yet. So Lu Bu does, and Dong Zhuo shows his anger by throwing weapons at him. It's unclear exactly why. It might be because he knew that Dong Zhu, that Lu Bu was helping himself to the women. Uh, either that, or Dong Zhuo already had enough of a temper. He was blaming Lu Bu for random stuff. And then Lu Bu knew, okay, if I get caught dallying with these women, then Dong Zhuo will take that as an act of betrayal and I will be killed. So I better hit him first. Either way, Lu Bu decides to join the conspiracy of Wang Yun. And two of them together ambush and kill 
Dong Zhuo. There's one account where Wang Yun's men arrest Dong Zhuo, and then he starts calling out for Lu Bu because he thinks that Lu Bu will emerge and save him as his bodyguard. But said Lu Bu shows up, pulls out a sword, and runs him through. So Lu Bu kills Dong Zhuo with his own hand. And like I said, I don't know for sure if he is a, an adopted son of Dong Zhuo or just a bodyguard. My suspicion is that he was more of a bodyguard. So now he becomes the commander of Wang Yun's army, which is pretty small and not comparable to the armies on the outskirts of Dong Zhuo's domains. Because just like any commander trying to defend a realm, you put your armies on the frontier where they actually have a use, rather than at the center where they're just fucking around with civilians and causing problems. So anyway, uh, Lu Bu, as a military commander, he's massively outmatched by the forces of Li Zhu, so I won't judge him for failing because he had no chance. And also, as we discussed, Wang Yun was massively incompetent when it came to do, uh, doing diplomacy and winning over followers. It's possibly one over Zhu Rong, but apparently Zhu Rong did not have that large of a following. So anyway, Lu Bu now has to cut his way out and escape east. He does so, but only after a fairly desperate battle against Guo Si, who was the second in command under Li Zhu. I won't go through all of Lu Bu's adventures in the east. Uh, suffice to say that despite his reputation in the games and in the novel as this guy who's just a pure brute, he does show a lot of wit at various times and a lot of shrewdness. So it's possible he's not a literary man or a scholar, but this is someone who's not an idiot. Someone, This is someone who can think on his feet and really come up with solutions to problems, at least when he's trying. So Lu Bu at various times will outsmart Cao Cao, Yuan Shao, Yuan Shu, Lu Bei. A lot of the major players of that era will get humiliated by Lu Bu. And a lot of that's because Lu Bu does not honor oafs, and he is someone without much sense of honor. So, But he does have enough charisma to convince you that he is legit, and then he'll just betray you. So that's, part, that's one of his talents. Um, so I'm not going to go into a lot of the details of Lu Bu as a commander, or as a faction leader, um, because we'll save that when we talk about the minor warlords. I feel like that's a little more fitting to really talk about Lu Bu's various deeds and how he managed to upstage bigger players on multiple occasions. And that might be why they tried to portray him as just some force of nature or some supernatural strength to explain why they got bettered by him a couple times. Suffice to say, he was someone with ability, but he does have a huge flaw. And again, it's because this man is a massive fucking asshole. Um, so later on, as he's under siege at Ja Pi, he will... Uh, become very harsh about discipline all of a sudden. So when one of his subordinates, Hu Ching, takes command of some alcohol, he tries to hand it over to Lu Bu as a present to try to butter him up. And Lu Bu threatens not only to, to confiscate it, but then to execute the man and to really punish him for this violation. And a lot of uh, Lu Bu's officers get furious at this. They say, well, what the fuck is this? We're here to help you. We're trying to help you, and you're accusing us of being traitors and threatening to execute us for extremely minor offenses. So this leads to the undermining of his whole position and leads to his downfall. And also, he got control of the city of Puyang because of the defection of Chen Gong. And then as soon as he gets Chen Gong under his command, after charming him, he basically just starts to ignore him completely for the next four years and never really listens to anything else Chen Gong has to say. So Lu Bu is someone who's very hard-headed and, like I said, just a complete asshole. Total piece of shit on a personal level. But he also is pretty shrewd and cunning. So it's hard to rate him. Rate him. Um, for now, based on his service to Dong Zhuo, I think he, he'll rank higher when we look at him as a warlord. As a warlord, he's actually pretty good overall despite the, his huge flaws but as a follower of Dong Zhuo um, I mean, he's pretty shitty I mean he's not completely inept he does keep Dong Zhuo safe until he decides to kill him 
There's a case for an F here because I mean the man is the bodyguard kills him. Uh, but at the same time, Dong Zhuo does give him some cause because Dong Zhuo was being paranoid, and uh, Dong Zhuo was a hypocrite about the issue of not touching the imperial women because he did it. Um, this one's tough. I'm going to go with a D for Lu Bu as a Dong Zhuo officer. Actually, but I gotta go lower. He 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 fucked up the Battle of Si Shui Gate by again being a dick. So yeah, he's an E. He's not an F because the battle at Si Shui wasn't big enough to determine the war. So I can't give him an F. But uh, he was not a very effective officer under Dong Zhuo, and again he did betray his master. Um, but when he was on his own, he does all right. Um, although, again, of course, his fatal flaw of being a huge asshole will undermine him. So let's see what people have to say about Lu Bu, because I imagine this will be a hot take in the eyes of many. Yeah, I mean, like, Lu Bu in the games is a total fucking beast, but he's very one-dimensional. He's one of those guys... He can lead units and trash people, but at the same time, he's a complete idiot and can't manage anything. And I think that's a little unfair, because actually I think Lu Bu was an intelligent person. He just was not someone who could run a faction. And again, a lot of it's just because he's too much of an asshole. And that seems like a very simplistic thing to say, but just look at his relations with everybody around him. He alienates everyone, ultimately. Uh, but he does have the charisma to initially win them over, and then he alienates them. Very consistent pattern. Next up is Zheng Liao. Uh, Zheng Liao, of course, will become one of the greatest generals of the Three Kingdoms. He will serve under Wei, but right now we're just considering his career under Dong Zhuo and Lu Bu. So his origins are obscure. We don't know much about him, but by 189 we do know that he's in the service of Ding Yuan. And, of course, that explains how he knows Lu Bu and how they came to be friends. Now, a lot of the Koei games list his date of birth as 169, but that's actually not attested in any source. We don't know when he was born. Most likely, he was a little bit older than that, because it would be kind of unusual for a minor warlord like Ding Yuan to entrust his entire army to a 20-year-old when he has other officers, including a Lu Bu, who's, I think, 34 at this time, at 189, so... Why would he give command of his whole army to a 20-year-old if he's got a 34-year-old who is also his adoptive son and a much more seasoned commander? It'd be completely incompetent. Anyway, uh, Zhang Liao is in service of Ding Yuan by 189. And his task is to recruit men north of the Yellow River and then report to Luoyang where he will serve under Ho Jin. Ho Jin at the time was trying to demonstrate force to the eunuchs, the ten attendants, and intimidate them, possibly kill them. But of course, before Zhang Liao and his men can arrive, the deed is done, the eunuchs assassinate Ho Jin, and then Yuan Shao retaliates, the eunuchs are all killed, so Zhang Liao retreats back to Ding Yuan. In the meantime, however, uh, Dong Zhuo has been summoned to court, and he manages to win over Lu Bu. So he corresponds with Lu Bu privately. Lu Bu then murders his adoptive father, Ding Yuan, and brings over that faction to Dong Zhuo. Zhang Liao, despite later being known as this great man of virtue, this man of upstanding morals, is fine with what Lu Bu did and goes along with it, joins him, and enters Dong Zhuo's service. So once again, a lot of that shit about virtue that we see in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms is just pure drivel. Um, a lot of these guys are either A, much more pragmatic, or B, much more amoral than they are presented in fiction. Uh, most of them are not spending hours and hours contemplating the nature of virtue, or how to be the most virtuous, pure warrior. That's just not reality. So, in the service of Dong Zhuo, Zhang Liao will be there for about three years, but we literally know of not a single thing that he does during this time. So, to the best of our knowledge, he does absolutely nothing in this period. Um, 
After 192, he flees with Lu Bu to the east. And once Lu Bu arrives in Zhu province and takes over from Liu Bei at uh, Xiaopi, and he also gains uh, Puyang temporarily, this is when he starts to use Zhang Liao as a senior commander and also to give him titles. So at one point, he actually gives Zhang Liao the title over some cities in the province that he doesn't control. So it's kind of like an aspirational appointment where he plans on taking control of the province from its capital at Xiaopi, but never gets around to it. And it's clear that Zhang Liao will be one of his major guys once that gets going. But again, it doesn't quite happen. Um, Zhang Liao will serve as Gao Shun's second-in-command. So while we typically think of Zhang Liao as being more important than Gao Shun based on what Zhang Liao does later, at the time in the 190s, actually Gao Shun is the senior commander of Lu Bu and does the most for Lu Bu. In fact, Gao Shun accomplishes more militarily than Lu Bu himself. But of course, we'll revisit that when we look at Lu Bu as an independent warlord and when we get to Gao Shun in his own right. Uh, Zhang Liao will be second in command when Gao Shun defeats Lu Bei and Zha Hu Dun separately. Meanwhile, while that battle is going on, Lu Bu is fighting his own battle further north, and he's defeated and besieged at Zha Pi. So Gao Shun and Zhang Liao will now have a camp that is at a remove from the main camp, and they will not really be able to relieve the siege. Um, Lu Bu was captured and executed, and along with Lu Bu, Chen Gong and Gao Shun are also killed. Zhang Liao will be in command of a separate detachment, presumably sent out by Gao Shun, and then he will turn over his men to Cao Cao. And unlike a lot of the dramatizations in the novel where Zhao, Zhang Liao claims, oh, I will die for my lord, I won't join you, and then Cao Cao says, I admire your loyalty. Instead, Cao Cao, he pursues Cao Cao, and he says, hey, I'd like to join you. Cao Cao says, fuck yeah, let's do it. That's how that happened. There was no, um, there's no soul searching or I have to be loyal to my lord Lu Bu. By the time that Lu Bu dies, Zhang Liao seems to have been discontented with him and was eager to join Cao Cao. And in fact, he might have been part of the betrayal of Lu Bu. We don't know. Uh, Gao Shun was never given that opportunity, as we'll see, even though he did nothing wrong and was a really good commander. Uh, for me, Zhang Liao, because of his role under Gao Shun, deserves at least a C. Uh, he did fine work as a subordinate, but he did not really get a chance to shine, which is unfortunate because, as we know, from hindsight, Zhang Liao is one of the great commanders of this era. But he was a late bloomer, and most of his great deeds would be done under Cao Cao starting about 10 years after he joined him. So, um, we'll revisit Zhang Liao when we talk about the Wei officers, and we'll see that he does indeed go on to kick some serious ass. It just takes a long time. Next up we have a very obscure officer I did not learn about until this research, and that is Huang Wan. He had a really interesting career. Um, he's someone whose whole career was predicated upon his grandfather being a big deal in the 150s. So Huang Wan was born in 141, and then he was really thrust into the limelight when his grandfather became Excellency over the masses in 153. And because of the preferential treatment that was given to anyone holding this office, the 12-year-old had the opportunity to join the bureaucracy at that time, at the age of 12. But he declined the offer. He said that he wasn't up for it health-wise, which is sort of the you know go-to excuse. And everyone understood that this was modesty on his part, so actually his reputation was really high early on. And he was seen as this great rising star in the Empire, someone who not only had opportunity and uh, illustrious ancestors, but also had a great deal of virtue. He does eventually enter into service, and by 163, when he's now 22, he will be the senior member of the Gentleman Cadets, and someone who has the ability to make or break fellow cadets by promoting them or writing negative reports about them. And for the most part at this time, corruption had come to the point where most appointments were made by connection, 
rather than by ability. But Huang Wang wanted to make it about ability. So he and one of his colleagues began to promote people based on merit and to ignore um, suggestions from senior commanders who wanted to promote their relatives. So this got him into a lot of shit with the eunuchs and with others. And basically what happened is that there were some really trumped up charges and Huang Wang and his uh, followers were banned from public office. So Huang Wan went from being one of the most promising, if not the most promising young officers in the empire to being banned from public service for 20 years. By now he's in his early 40s and his story has become something of a watchword for just how corrupt the court has become. So when people are talking about the eunuchs and the problems with them, Huang Wan is an example they can point to as someone who really got railroaded. Now, in the early 180s, a powerful patron will take up his cause and get him promoted again to be an inspector in Jing province. And then he will hold several more positions. During the Yellow Turban Rebellion uh, and the Liang Revolt, he was at Luoyang and he held some court offices. So now he's got influence at court. And Despite the fact that he missed most of his career due to being banned, he's now, once again, prestigious and in the public limelight. Um, in 188, he was dispatched to Yu province, which is a small but highly populated province in the middle of the Central Plains, so very important. And here he does really well, not only dealing with local disturbances, but also with governing in an uncorrupt fashion. When Dong Zhuo then seized power in 189, Huang Wang was appointed to his grandfather's old post of excellency over the masses, and this is part of Dong Zhuo's attempt to really mask what he's doing as being legal and restoring order to the court after the anarchy of the eunuchs. Um, at first, they seemed to get along fine, and actually Dong Zhuo decided to promote him one step more to Grand Commandant, which is a very high rank at court. However, when Deng Zhuo decided to relocate the capital from Luoyang to the west, uh, to the west in Chang'an, uh, one of the two men who really spoke out vehemently was Huang Wang, and for that reason he was removed from office, but Deng Zhuo would not punish him physically because he was afraid of Huang Wang's prestige. So he didn't want to make a martyr out of him. Which again is evidence that Deng Zhuo was not a complete moron. Uh, so he, Dong Zhuo was ruthless, but he's not an idiot about it, unlike many other people will discuss and already have discussed. Um, so another man who was deposed at the time was Yang Biao. We'll talk about him later. Um, he was forced to formally apologize to Dong Zhuo for disagreeing with him in court, which apparently was fairly common. If you did disagree with the court you often were sacked and then demoted. So this was not a practice unique to the Han court or to Dong Zhuo, by the way. This is also something that we see with Yuan Shao. And it would appear that actually Cao Cao, one of his, I guess, abilities, if you will, is that he could tolerate dissent a little better than most. Uh, that's one of the things that made him stand out a bit. Whereas most of these guys are all like Dong Zhuo, they will not tolerate the scent. Uh, Yuan Shao also jails advisors who told him what he didn't want to hear. So it's not something limited to Dong Zhuo. Um, by 192, Huang Wan is now plotting with Wang Yun. But uh, then he enters the administration of Wang Yun early on. However, that government was completely ineffective, largely due to Wang Yun being incompetent. And Huang Wang was among the men who died when Li Zhu seized power. So uh, he did not last long in the Wang Yun government. So we have to rank him largely on what he did under Dong Zhuo. For me, he's a D. He's not effective at all. Uh, he wasn't necessarily a bad guy, but he was not able to really hold back the excesses of Dong Zhuo. And he also failed to hold back the excesses of Wang Yun as well or to give Wang Yun any kind of direction. So whatever ability that he had was a bit of a waste. 
Next up, we have his running mate, another man who opposed Dong Zhuo's movement of the capital, Yang Biao. And just like uh, the previous gentleman, Yang Biao does not get a portrait in Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Uh, his father was famous. His father was named Yang Si. And um, despite being the son of a famous man, Yang Biao went on to become a distinguished scholar in his own right. So he was not someone who entirely lived in his father's shadow. Although he was born in 142, he delayed his entry to court. He resisted a number of invites to come to the capital and was only in 177 at the age of 35 when he finally got a summons he could not refuse and that was the summons to help create the new history of the Han up to the year 168. This was a summons that he received alongside of the more famous scholar Kai Yong. So Yang Biao uh, stayed at court all those years working on the history although it was mostly Kai Yong's baby. That's a very odd topic. It's hard to know exactly how this was composed, but we'll get to that later when we talk about Kai Yong. Uh, Yang Biao will really butt heads with Dong Zhuo in 191 when he opposes moving the capital. He also will be demoted, um, actually removed from office completely. Once, Liu Zhu, once Li Zhu restores, uh, once Li Zhu takes power, he does restore Yang Biao to his position. Uh, then they butt heads when he resists something Li Zhu wants to do, so Li Zhu removes him and then appoints him yet again. Uh, so Yang Biao was not afraid to protest and be removed from office for his efforts. He has some civic courage. When Emperor Xian decided to go east, Yang Biao accompanies him. And it was he who helped broker a deal with Duan Wei to cooperate with the Imperial Party and help them against the pursuing forces of Li Zhu. Yang continued to serve the Emperor under Cao Cao, but did run into some trouble when uh, he and Cao Cao butted heads pretty severely. That's an interesting story, but it's a story we will not talk about now. We will talk about that when we talk about the officers of Wei. Uh, spoiler, Yang Biao becomes one of them. Anyway, uh, Yang Biao, in terms of his service to Dong Zhuo, is a C in my book. He does okay. And that's about it. Alright, next up, we have Kai Yang. And before we get to Kai Yang, let's make sure everything is going okay over here. Cool. All right. So everything's still going fine. Okay. Kai Yang. So he's born in 132 in the city of Chin Lu, which makes him one of the older gentlemen we'll talk about. He's one of the last great scholars of the Han era. So the Han, over the course of their history, produced many great scholars, and Kai Yang is kind of the seal on that group. He was known for strong filial piety and also for being someone who was very skilled in a number of different arts and sciences. So he's a polymath. He also was the first in his family to achieve empire-wide fame. His father before him had been famous locally, but it was only Kai Yang who broke out and became famous across the Han lands. This is despite having a pretty modest inheritance, because for three generations, including his own, the family had divided the inheritance equally among all the children, meaning that by the time of Kai Yang, the inheritance was pretty modest. He wrote a number of texts over the course of his life, and a lot of them he wrote away from court. He was not the kind of guy who uh, came to court easily or for no reason. The one invitation that eventually got him to come to court was the one from 177, issued by the Emperor Ling, and uh, which was designed to take the history of the Han up to 168, uh, with the death of Emperor Huan, the predecessor of Emperor Ling. Once he got to court, he was viewed as an expert in many things, including music, ceremonial, and because of that, he had a huge amount of influence. And it's possible that once he arrived, he butted heads with other scholars at court whose influence was now diminished. 
And that would include, of course, Wang Yun, who later on developed a deadly hatred and had him executed on pretty much day one. But Kai Yong seems to have been something of a know-it-all who was not afraid to tell other people that they were wrong. And here was the truth. So, by the late 170s, a lot of his memorials, or his sort of memos that he would issue, would basically say the policy of the court put forward by the eunuchs was wrong, and here are eight reasons why they're a bunch of morons. And that was kind of how a lot of his memorials went, and those got him in less trouble than you might think. But it did get him in some trouble. Um, he was banished to the northeast at first, so banished to the frontier, sort of with Korea or Manchuria, but he managed to successfully lobby the Emperor Ling to have that alleviated because he said, I still need to finish my history of the Han. So instead, he was able to go into exile in Wu, what would later become Eastern Wu under the Sun family, but the city of Wu, which is on the eastern seaboard. Pretty nice place, and pretty far away from court. But despite the distance that he kept from the court for about 12 years, he still was in contact, and in 187, he would write and send a eulogy of one of the ladies at court that had been his friend. So uh, he still was in contact and aware of what was happening back at home, but he was living on the eastern extremity of the empire. Um, after about 12 years or so, he's brought back by Dong Zhuo, and Dong Zhuo summoned him back in a pretty brusque and uncouth fashion by basically saying, if you don't come back to court and take office under me to shore up my legitimacy, I will round up your family and kill them. So that's fun. It's always fun. Uh, so Kai Yong, predictably, comes back to court. Kai Yong did manage to persuade Dong Zhuo to not take some of the more exaggerated titles he was entertaining. So Dong Zhuo, of course, acted extremely arrogantly, and that's what turned a lot of the warlords against him. But had he not had the advice of Kai Yong, he might have gone further with that and taken up more titles that he did not deserve that would have really pissed people off. So, if anything, Kai Yong actually served him pretty well. Uh, when Wang Yun came to power and demanded his execution, Kai Yong once again pled that he had not finished his history yet and begged to be given time to complete it. But Wang Yun's reply is that we let Sima Qian finish his history of China and it was just a bunch of slanders that he put to paper and transmitted his history. I will not give this bastard that opportunity. So off with Kai Yong's head. In the meantime, however, while he thought about it, Wang Yun had a change of heart and realized he was just being a petty asshole. So he issued a countermanding order, but it did not arrive in time, and so Kai Yong was put to death. This made Kai Yong into an empire-wide symbol of a martyr. And in fact, Kai Yong was so popular on the empire that images representing him were erected, and then people read out eulogies that they composed locally in his honor. So in many ways, the legitimacy of the Han court, what little remained there, and what little fealty people had, was really damaged by the death of this great scholar who did nothing wrong. And Wang Yun, for his part, could have been a liberator from Dong Zhuo's tyranny, but instead showed himself to be a man exactly like Dong Zhuo. So he undermined himself really badly from the outset, and that was one of the many missteps that he took. Um, one of the areas where he was especially honored was, of course, his home area of Chen Lu. And you can imagine that one of his fellow uh, residents of the area, Sao Tsao, really played this up like a motherfucker. So Sao Tsao had claimed a friendship with Kai Yong and now really played up their link, had a big funeral, etc. Kai Yong had a personal library of some 10,000 or so scrolls. And those were distributed between his son-in-law and his daughter, Kai Yan. Uh, his son-in-law's collection was destroyed in the fighting between Li Zhu and Guo Xi, which resulted in a number of fires in the city. So that was about over half of the collection, about 6,000 scrolls lost. Kai Yan was captured by the Zhang Nu during a raid. 
and then she was kept as a sex slave by the king before she was eventually ransomed by Sal. Um, so she lost all her scrolls as well. Later on, um, her husband that she married after she came back from being a captive was accused of treason and executed, but Sal, of course, did not go after Kai Yan because he knew she wasn't involved. And he regarded her as a friend because of his previous connection with uh, Kai Yang. So he brought her to court and he asked her about her misfortunes and where her scrolls were. She said, well, I would give you my scrolls, but I lost all of them during my travails. Um, so I had 4,000 of them. I was not able to memorize all of them. I did memorize 400 of them. Sao Tsao replies, okay, I'll send you some scribes. You can dictate to them. We'll record all these scrolls. She says, it'd be easier if you just gave me materials and let me write them out. Okay, fine. So Kai Yan, Kai Yang's daughter, would record some 400 of the scrolls out of his library by memory. And apparently people who were familiar with those works looked at him after Kai Yan copied them and said, Damn, her memory's amazing. This is perfect. So, uh, yeah, anyway, Kai Yang was one of the great scholars. His daughter was of equal ability, and had she been a man, uh, obviously she would have achieved a whole lot more in that society. It's amazing what she achieved as a woman, even. And uh, also, in Romance of the Three Kingdoms 10, if you play the game, Kai Yan is kind of the woman that you can pursue, that everybody has the chance to pursue. Because she writes poetry, and you can like try to match wits with her and win her over. I've never pulled that off, despite all the hundreds of hours I've put into that game since 2005. I don't know how you do it, but anyway, it is doable, I know that. Um, Kai Yang, for me, is unrankable. Um, he's one of those guys who's clearly very influential in the Han Empire. He was a great scholar, like I said, but not someone who really did that much for the Dong family. If anything, if I had to rank him as... Actually, I think I'm going to rank him now I think about it. Um, I'm going to put him as a C. Uh, he's going to be a C because he did help Dong Zhuo to avoid some major missteps that he would have taken that would have made things much worse. And it's worth mentioning. Uh, one other fun fact about Dong Zhuo. If you play any of the games or read the novels, or the, it's just a novel. I shouldn't say novels. Just, the novel... Uh, Lu Bei is a big part of the coalition against Dong Zhuo. Historically, however, there's no evidence that Lu Bei was involved with that at all. So, another fun fact for you. So, that's it for Kai Yang. Let me check the audio one more time, make sure we're still good. Alright, um... Back to the list. Next up, we have Jun Yu. And this is Jun X U N U Y O U. Yu in Chinese can also be Y U. And I, I make that distinction because it will become relevant in just a minute. And it will also become relevant again when we look at the officers away. So, Jun Yu with an O uh, was a child prodigy born in 157 who, like many others, decided to delay his entry in the service until he was 23 in 189. Or, no, 33, excuse me, 189, uh, when Ho Jin was trying to recruit as many talented men as he could to the court shortly before his death. So he did arrive and take service, but then his would-be master was killed, and now he was stuck at a court run by Dong Zhuo. He joined the plotters against Dong Zhuo, and in 192, as a part of that second plot, which ultimately succeeded, he was caught. And he was put in jail and would probably have been arrested if not for the success of the plot under Wang Yun and Lu Bu. By this point, too, he was a little bit too old to get away with the well, I was just a kid who was misguided. He was about 36 years old, so eh, it'd be kind of hard to make that argument. So he managed to escape from that, and while Wang Yun did restore him to his offices, instead of taking up his post, he decided that he had had enough of Chang'an and the chaos there, and so he decided to flee to Jing province, where things were stable and where the elderly, kindly Lu Biao was in charge. So he would hang out there for a few years to rest and recuperate, and then, I believe it was in 198 or 199, Jun Yu, with a Yu, who I believe was his uncle, was an advisor to Sao Tsao and was 
told South Sao they needed to recruit Jun Yu with an O, which Sao Sao did, and so he became an officer at Zhu Chang and went on to serve with significant distinction in Sao Sao's army. But of course, that is a story we'll take up when we look at the officers of Wei. For now, Jun Yu with an O is a Yu, because we don't know enough about him to judge him for his time under Dong Zhuo. Next up is a man who also owes most of his fame to a later time. This is Hu Qi'er, also sometimes in the Koei games called Hu or Qi, but the standard spelling is definitely Hu Qi'er. He was an officer of Zhang Zhu in 197. He's often believed to have been in Dong Zhuo's service, but we don't have any firm attestation to that fact. Um, he was known as a fairly bold officer, but surprisingly he doesn't really play that big of a role in Zhang Zhu's battles with Cao Cao. We will revisit him when we talk about um, Zhang Zhu and Jia Zhu in greater detail since Hu Qi was one of their or Hu Qi er was one of their major colleagues. For now though he's unrateable because he didn't do enough to really deserve a ranking or to uh, distinguish himself one way or another. Next up, we have someone we definitely can rate, and that is Li Zhu. So Li Zhu was one of the more senior commanders in Dong Zhuo's army. He first emerges in history in 190 when he serves the diplomat to Sun Jian, trying to make peace between the two of them, and trying to win over Sun Jian to Dong Zhuo's command, but that embassy failed. Um... There's a possibility that in the Great Raiding Party of 192, led by Niu Fu, that actually Li Zhu was the commander and Niu Fu stayed behind. But it's most likely, I would say 95% certain, that Niu Fu was the commander and Li Zhu was his second. So Li Zhu was on that big raid to Chen Lu. When Niu Fu was killed in the mutiny, Li Zhu takes command. Um... Uh, there's a, there's a chance at least that Lu Zhu, because he was a vicious and ambitious man, was behind the assassination. But also, we have to remember that Li Zhu was rather incompetent. So if the assassination went off successfully, there's no way he could have gotten away with it undetected uh, based on the fact that he's Li Zhu. So most likely it did have to be exactly how it was stated, just a bodyguard taking advantage of the situation and trying to cash in. And Li Zhu is just a dumb fuck who's there to take advantage. So when he takes command at Hong Nong, he really didn't have much certainty about his position. He's not the kind of guy who does well on his own. He's a fine commander if you just want somebody to order around on the battlefield or do some very basic stuff. But Li Zhu does not really have the intellect to do much more. Um... He wants Wang Yun to basically pardon him and then accept him as an officer. Wang Yun does not send that offer to him. So he becomes very insecure, and he has to be urged on by his officers to move on Chang On and seize power, which he does. And this ends up being a very easy battle, by the way. It's not hard to overwhelm Wang Yun and Lu Bu, despite Li Zhu's uh, misgivings at first. And to a certain extent, the conflict between Wang Yun and Li Zhu was easily avoidable. Li Zhu was very, very willing to make terms, but Wang Yun wanted nothing to do with it, so uh, Wang Yun ends up getting killed, Li Zhu takes power. So it looks also like Jia Zhu, as we mentioned earlier, had to give him that command, or give him that advice. So Li Zhu wisely, once he comes into power, makes peace with the Eastern Warlords, so now the state of war that existed between East and West ends... There's no more coalition against Dong Zhuo because Dong Zhuo is dead, and Li Zhu is effectively Dong Zhuo's successor after he defeats Zhu Rong, Wang Yun, and Lu Bu. But his position is not nearly as strong, and part of it is because not only had he chased off a number of people, and a lot of people had died in the Civil War, but also that Li Zhu just does not have the prestige to hold such a high command. So. He takes up the title of General of Chariots and Cavalry, and that is what he uses to sort of control the Emperor. But unlike Cao Cao, he doesn't really know how to get decrees out of the Emperor to ride and to try to pretend to be the head of government for the whole Han. 
perhaps part of his agreement with the Eastern Warlords that he would just protect the Emperor but not really do much with him. At any rate, Li Zhu doesn't take advantage of the position that he has or his strong army relative to all his rivals. He just kind of sits around. And he's basically a party boy in many ways. He likes to throw huge parties with Guo Si and others where they get massively wasted and just shoot the shit and celebrate their success. Li Zhu also had a problem in that he was a bit of an irrational person who was very superstitious and even went so far as to privately sacrifice the spirit of Dong Zhuo. He did literally see himself as Dong Zhuo's avenger. Um, and his loyalty to Dong Zhuo extended beyond life. Um, which again goes to show that while Dong Zhuo was mostly very negatively portrayed, there were some people who very much identified with him and saw him as a great hero. When the Emperor promoted Li Zhu to a higher rank in 194, he thought this was because of the sacrifices he made to Dong Zhuo, and that Dong Zhuo from the grave had made this happen. So he decided to redouble his efforts to honor the dead Dong Zhuo. Um, in 194, Li Zhu faced his first major challenge. There was an internal revolt in the city and also an invasion by Han Sui, who was one of the warlords in Jiliang. So he sends out Fang, Fan Chao, who's his third in command, with his second in command, Guo Si, to deal with the external problem. He deals with the revolt at home ably. And the two men uh, he sends out are able to deal with the revolt. When they come back, he holds a banquet for Fan Chao, who had been a very good general under him. And he's jealous that Fan Chao is popular with the troops. So at the banquet, he has Fan Chao murdered and then takes control of his men. And it's after that that Guo Si, his second in command, thinks, holy fuck, this man is not to be trusted. He's paranoid and dangerous. So this leads to Guo Si revolting in 195, and the city becomes a literal war zone for months. And in that chaos, the Emperor Xian decides to flee east. We've already talked about that a bit. Um, so in that chaos, he's fleeing east. Li Zhu is slowly winning the war against Guo Si, but ultimately once the Emperor escapes, they decide they have to band together to recover him. They try to do that and fail. Uh, Li Zhu then returns to Chang'an. He makes peace with Guo Si, who gets to keep a, a fort outside the city, but then Guo Si is betrayed by a subordinate, possibly due to Li Zhu. And from 196 forward, Li Zhu is effectively living in the ruins of Chang'an as the ruler. He still has control of the outlying areas such as Hong Nong and the areas of the west, but he is ultimately diminished because he has done so much damage to himself and because he's killed so many and because the city's a wreck. In 198, Cao Cao sent an imperial official with the decree to deal with and depose Li Zhu, and many of Li Zhu's officers just obey it. So Li Zhu is done in by his own officers, ultimately, because he had lost legitimacy and he looked weak in front of his men, so they decided to get rid of him and effectively all defected to Cao Cao. Most notably, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Duan Wei. So, Li Zhu is a clear-cut F. This guy sucks. That being said, I find his story amusing, and we'll get into more details of how the fallout between himself and Guo Si went, and the fictional account of Li Zhu's degeneracy is fucking hilarious, by the way. Uh, read the novel. If you've never read Romance of the Three Kingdoms, read the novel. It's great. But especially pay attention to the parts about the Li Zhu Guo Si rivalry, because that is hilarious. Some of the best comedy ever written. I don't know how exaggerated it is, but it's it's amazing. Speaking of Guo Si, let's talk about him in just a minute. Let me check uh, over here first, make sure everything's still good. Okay. All right, still good here. All right, Guo Si. So Guo Si, his origins are unknown, but he was first attested as part of Nu Fu's force in 192, the raiding party. Uh, when Li Zhu assumed command after Nu Fu died, Guo Si became a second in command of the army. 
later on when they take Cheng on, Guo Xi will then become Li Zhu's second in command as well. There's a possibility if Jia Zhu had more asserted himself that he would have become that man, but he didn't. And of course, Fan Chao becomes number three. So Guo Xi will be the chief lieutenant, and he and Li Zhu will be as thick as thieves for a few years. Um, so for the first couple of years, there are a lot of drinking parties. Both men attend. They become good friends. But Guo Xi's wife is not a big fan of this. She thinks that her husband is banging one of the women in Li Zhu's household. And so she tells him, Honey, I think Li Zhu is jealous of you and wants to have you assassinated. And at first, Guo Xi says, That's fucking stupid. I'm his best boy. You know, we're, we're tight. He's not going to kill me. But then, of course, there's that incident with Fan Chao we'll get to. In the meantime, uh, Guo Xi went with Fan Chao. The two of them dealt with Ma Teng and Han Sui. And then, of course, the Chang invasion. It's unclear who was in command. Most likely, it would have been Guo Xi. But apparently, Fan Chao won most of the accolades from the campaign. Guo Xi comes home. And apparently, what his wife said now kind of resonated after Fan Chao's death. So he's at one party with um, his buddy, Li Zhu. He gets annihilated drunk, and then he takes an emetic to make himself throw up, and apparently he's too drunk to disguise why he's doing it, and he says, well, I don't want to be poisoned. Uh, so Li Zhu, who apparently had no intention of betraying Guo Xi, is deeply pissed off, and assumes this means that Guo Xi's playing against him. So Li Zhu begins to move against him, Guo Xi, to defend himself, starts taking high officials as captives and holding them hostage. So Li Zhu retaliates for doing the same thing. So they have the city divided into armed camps. They're fighting. Li Zhu basically has the emperor as hostage. Guo Xi has a lot of the officials. Uh, once the emperor escapes from Li Zhu's custody, they do reconcile. Especially after Guo Xi tries and fails to capture the emperor before he escapes. The two of them are unable, unable to really do anything else. Uh, they run into trouble with Duan Wei. They come home, and Guo Xi gets a fortress outside of the city, so that when the, the fighting. But then he's murdered by a subordinate who turns over the fortress to Li Zhu. It's unclear whether Li Zhu had anything to do with that or not. With Guo Xi, I cannot give him an F because he did manage to successfully deal, in part at least, with two threats to the realm. So he's not a complete moron the way that uh, Li Zhu was. Uh, that being said, I can't give him a passing grade either because of his role in that civil war that was completely unnecessary. So I will give him a D. So I think uh, Guo Xi is pretty inept, but he's not the worst. Next up we have Fan Chao. So, uh, Fan Chao first appears when he joins up with Li Zhu to seize Chang An, and he does well enough in that operation that Li Zhu offers him a position as the third in command of the new regime. He went with Guo Xi to repress the forces of Ma Teng and Han Sui in early 194, and then repulsed a Qiang invasion later in the year. At one point, he has a conference with Han Sui. Han Sui, of course, is the senior of the great gentlemen of the far west and uh, in their conference they spoke privately and this led to gossips really making shit up about what happened and making it look like Fan Chao had done something that was dishonorable. One of the men who spread such rumors was Li Zhu's nephew Li Li and the reason why Li Li held a grudge is because Fan Chao was a disciplinarian who had reprimanded Li Li for not fighting hard enough on campaign and basically called him a bitch. So Li Li proved to be a bitch by ratting on him to his uncle. And this is part of why Li Zhu decided to have Fan Chao put to death. Not just out of jealousy, but because his nephew was spreading slander. So Li Zhu kills Fan Chao, takes command of his troops, and that sends a warning sign to Guo Xi and others that Li Zhu is jealous, petty, and dangerous. And most likely, this was the real cause of the split between Li Zhu and Guo Xi. Uh, although it's possible also that his wife's advice finally uh, bore fruit. 
So Fan Chao's death is what really sparks the Civil War. If Li Zhu had kept his jealousy intact or ignored his nephew, then there's a good chance that he's not remembered as one of the biggest jokes of the Three Kingdoms period. Because make no mistake about it, Li Zhu is one of the biggest jokes of this whole period. In the novel and in history. I mean, Li Zhu is dog shit. But in a way, I kind of like him in the way that I like the Emperor Elagabalus, in the sense that uh, he takes incompetence and makes a fine art out of it. I mean, his incompetence is brilliant, in a way, because it's just so well-developed. Anyway, as for Fan Chao, to me, he's a B. The man does what he's supposed to do, and he does it well. He defends the realm ably, and then he gets betrayed by his boss. Uh, not his fault. But he's decent. Next up, we have Chen Gong, one of the more well-known officers, I would say, of the Three Kingdoms period, at least one of the more well-known minor officers. So, we don't know whether or not he served under Dong Zhuo. It's possible, though. We do know that he joined up with Cao Cao early after Cao Cao left uh, Dong Zhuo's service. In fiction, he accompanies Cao Cao back to Chen Lu, and he sees the negative side of Cao Cao's character, where Cao Cao basically says, I would rather uh, betray the world and have the world betray me, and then he butchers a family that hosts him on the grounds that he heard knives in the kitchen and assumed that he was about to get killed, but it was really just people preparing food. Um, in reality, Chen Gong, it's unclear exactly why he turns against Cao Cao. Most likely, it was to advance himself, uh, Cao Cao had a number of capable officers around him, and Chen Gong was probably sort of lost in the shuffle. Chen Gong's betrayal took place in 194, and this time Cao Cao was engaged against Tao Qian and the Zhu province. And at this time, Lu Bu was a man with an army and no land, so Chen Gong invited him to the city of Puyang, which was in the same province as Chen Lu. Uh, Lu Bu seized the city and held it for about a year before Cao Cao was able to retake it. This, this made the breach between Chen Gong and Cao Cao irreparable. So after this, there was no going back, and Cao Cao was determined to have Chen Gong's head. However, despite Lu Bu being initially very open and very charming, as soon as Chen Gong handed him the city, Lu Bu basically just ignored Chen Gong for the next four years and didn't really give a shit about what he had to say. Um, by In 198, Lu Bu was now under siege at Xia Pi with all of his officers except for Gao Shun, Zhang Liao, and a few others who were outside the city. Chen Gong was trapped in Xia Pi with Lu Bu. Lu Bu was becoming increasingly unstable and cruel to his officers. And so, when Hu Qing would defect to Cao Cao, one of the men that he brought with him to try to win favor was none other than Chen Gong, who he captured and brought as a present. So, um, Cao Cao, of course, had Lu Bu put to death. He also killed Chen Gong and Gao Shun. And in fiction... There's a lot more hesitancy on Cao Cao's part. Historically, it looks like he was absolutely determined to kill Chen Gong, no matter what he said. But because they had once been friends, he did agree to Chen Gong's dying wish that he'd look after his family. And so far as we know, Cao Cao did exactly that, and Chen Gong's family was taken care of and provided for. So, um, in fiction, Chen Gong is sort of this capable and shrewd officer who was wily in battle and was effectively Lu Bu's brain, but as we discussed, Lu Bu was not an idiot, so he didn't need someone to figure out basic things for him. So Chen Gong was largely unnecessary, and Lu Bu didn't really give a shit about what Chen Gong had to say anyway. Uh, so Chen Gong, to me, is an E, especially as an officer of Lu Bu. He doesn't really do that much. He gives him a city and then kind of retreats. Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll put him in a, a D, because giving him Pu Yang is a pretty big deal. It's a pretty big coup. But beyond that, uh, he, he sold his entire career and life for one city and then was completely shelved after that. Whether he had any actual ability or not is unclear. We don't know.
we assume because Lu Guang Zhang, when he wrote the novel, assumed that Chen Gong had actual ability. We don't know that, though. Next up, we have the best officer of Lu Bu, Gao Shun. So we don't know where Gao Shun got his start. It's possible that he, too, was under the command of Dong Zhuo at one point. He is first attested in the year 196. At this time, he is one of Lu Bu's officers, and there is a mutiny by the commander Hao Meng. And during the mutiny, Lu Bu is forced out of camp, running for his life, and he goes to the smaller camp outside of Gao Shun for aid. Gao Shun calmly agrees to help, leads his men in the camp, puts down their mutiny, restores order. He then created and led a unit of 700 men whose specialty was breaking enemy lines to create confusion. And this was a highly successful unit which did really well and helped Lu Bu establish a peace. Because remember, Lu Bu is fighting against everybody who's around. But as soon as peace fell, Lu Bu played favorites and relieved Gao Shun in favor of his kinsman, Wei Zhu. Once war broke out again, of course, he had to turn back to Gao Shun to take command because Gao Shun was easily his best general. And in fact, Gao Shun is a better general than Lu Bu himself. During the fight for Xia Pi, Gao Shun was commanding one of the outside areas of the city, whereas Lu Bu was commanding nearer to the city. Lu Bu was defeated and driven back into the city walls, but Gao Shun held his position gamely, defeating separately both Lu Bei and Xia Hu Dun both of whom were experienced commanders. Now, neither of them were military geniuses, but both of them had experience, and neither was a complete slouch. Once Lu Bu surrendered, Cao Cao also captured Gao Shun and had him executed. Most likely, he was just angry that Gao Shun had been so loyal to Lu Bu and also that he had had success. Because, remember, Zha Hu Dun is a cousin and very close friend of Cao Cao, and... Gao Shun had kicked his ass. Also, Lu Bei was in camp advising Cao Cao on what to do with the captured men, and he too had been embarrassed by Gao Shun. So, there was a good chance that a lot of Gao Shun's death was not due to any failing on his part or any atrocity or whatever, but simply due to the fact that he was captured by men who were pissed off that they had lost battles to him. So, Gao Shun, in my estimation, is actually an A. He was a very good general in admittedly limited circumstances, but what he was faced with he achieved, and also he was someone who trained a special unit which had uh, a purpose in battle and did its purpose very well. So he's someone who, if given great opportunities, I think would have really done well. And uh, actually, if anything, this is one of Sao Cao's greatest misses, was not recruiting Gao Shun to his ranks. Unlike in fiction, we have no idea if Gao Shun refused to serve. In fiction, he refuses to serve. We don't know if that's true or not. So, keep that in mind. Now, let's check the audio one last time. Before we get to the last three. The final three. Alright. Um... Theory that Zhu Rong was recalled because he was so successful and Dong Zhuo was wear, uh, weary. Uh, that's a possibility. I would not be surprised. Dong Zhuo was the kind of guy to be very leery of his subordinates. So, yeah, that's totally possible. Absolutely. I don't know for sure, though. And now for our final three. Uh, and this is why I said this is the Dong Zhuo and Lu Bu show, because we're going to go through the other known officers of Lu Bu real fast. Uh, there's not much about them, and as I was doing the research for this, I realized that my initial plan to do a Lu Bu stream would have been a waste, because there just isn't enough. So, Hu Qing. He's a known follower of Lu Bu, first attested in 198 during the Siege of Xia Pi. He's widely assumed by, say, Koei in their games to be an officer of Dong Zhuo before, but we don't actually know that for certain. There's no attestation of that in history or fiction, actually. Um, Hu Cheng is the guy who came across the liquor and tried to give some to Lu Bu. But then Lu Bu said, you violated my prohibition against liquor, you will be put to death for this violation. 
and Hu Ching felt that this was unjust, as did most of his fellow officers, and this caused mass demoralization and a defection. So Hu Ching leads the defection, grabbing control of uh, Chen Gong and a few others and going over the Sao Tsao, and uh, that really broke the back of Lu Bu's resistance. That being said, in terms of judging Hu Ching as a commander, he's a Yu, and as a Wei officer, he's never employed, probably because he is a traitor, so Cao Cao didn't want to give him a chance. He never got one. Hu Ching is one of those guys whose only significance is being a famous traitor. But given that Lu Bu was as much of an asshole as he was, I can't exactly condemn that in this case. So... It makes sense. Also, the situation was desperate, and a lot of that was due to Lu Bu's failures. Next up is another general in the same exact spot, Song Jian. He's first tested in 198 during the siege of Jia Pi as an officer of Cao Cao. We don't know if he served under Dong Zhuo or not. Song Jian uh, protested what was happening to Hu Qing, but Lu Bu then told him, well, you're a traitor too. So Song Jian said, okay, fuck you, I'm joining Hu Qing, let's defect. So he goes with Hu Qing to Cao Cao's camp. And, uh, yeah, so what the way that Lu Bu treated Hu Qing was enough to turn many men against him. Song Jian was yet another one. He's also a Yu. Uh, we don't know enough about his particular deeds to know much about him or how to rank him. And last... And pretty close to least, in terms of what we know about him, is Wei Zhu. Uh, he's a relative of Lu Bu. That's one detail we have about him we don't have about the others. So he's some sort of kinsman of Lu Bu. And he's attested slightly prior to Hu Qing and Song Jian because back when Gao Shun comes on the scene in 196 and organizes his special unit, uh, when peace breaks out, Lu Bu decides to reward his kinsman by giving him Gao Shun's unit. But of course, Wei Zhu does not have the kind of clout with them that uh, Gao Shun has because he didn't found the unit. So uh, this was a bad idea. He has to reverse it eventually, and um, Wei Zhu, of course, never gets a chance to really shine. Partly because the troops won't let him. When war resumes, uh, Lu Bu turns back to Gao Shun, and Wei Zhu is just another officer under his command at Jia Pi. Wei Zhu, because he has a little bit more clout with Lu Bu, stands up directly to Lu Bu about the Hu Qing situation. So when he does that, Lu Bu says, Ah, you're a traitor, cousin. I knew it. You don't have my best interest at heart. You're one of Cao Cao's men. I'll have you arrested and executed too. So Wei Zhu says, Okay, fuck you. I'm going to Cao Cao. And that's what happens. Uh, he goes with the other guys. He's with his fellow officers against his cousin or whatever, Lu Bu. But I can't really rate Wei Zhu on this basis. Um, again, Lu Bu was not stable. He was a complete asshole. And betraying him is neither noble nor ignoble. It's just one of those things that happened. So, those are my thoughts on the officers of the Three Kingdoms. At least the officers of Dong Zhuo and Lu Bu. That's all I have for you. Uh, thank you all for joining me this evening. Uh, got a bit of late start, as you all know, so I, I thank you all for waiting for this. Um, next week, Sean will be back. I forget what we're doing next week, but hopefully it will be interesting. I, I think it might be the Claiborne, the Claiborne etc. stream. I'm not sure, though. Uh, we'll have to not to touch base with Sean and somebody else on this, but anyway, it'll be a bit of a it'll be a while before we get back to the Three Kingdoms, though. That much I do know. So, and if we do get back to it in the near future, it most likely will not be on a Sunday. It will be on some other day of the week. So, I might have some special streams on a Wednesday or Thursday or something like that, and then we'll get back into the Three Kingdoms. But for now, that's all I have for you, and um, we'll pick this back up later when we get the opportunity. So thank you all once again for joining me. And uh, yeah, I'll see you next Sunday. And also this week, I'll have to publish a few different lectures on the Roman Republic for one of the classes I'm teaching. So be on the lookout for that. If I am productive, I will also be putting out 
this week or maybe next week lectures about the Crusades because I'm planning on replacing my old lectures from five years ago with new ones uh, also for a class that I'm working on so be on the lookout for all that and in the meantime thank you once again for joining me and I hope everybody has a great week peace out Waffle